Good morning, all. Uh, welcome to our 2023 Patient and Caregiver Symposium. And uh, for the 75 people who are signed in online, uh, welcome remotely. And for the 25 who are signed up to be here in person, uh, welcome. And please don't hesitate because this is really all about you all. Uh, it's really a program that we've done for 25 uh, or more years. Um, and basically has had the mission to impart cutting edge progress that we all have had the pleasure to witness. The progress um, really depends upon a team that we have in part uh, represented here and our collaborative practice nurses like Julie, who's there and our PAs, Melissa, uh, Katie, Dom, who are all uh, here on this table. Um, our residents who actually are inspirations because they're the next generation who will take over this field, uh, Andrew Knight um, and the faculty. A um, couple of unsung heroes that we won't feature in our presentation this morning, and I guess I don't need to wear this up here, um, are our pathologists, our surgical oncologists, the people who do the work behind the scenes who really make all of what we do uh, possible. And we'll bring them next year maybe. Um, the uh, progress that we've had is nothing short of um, astounding. Having been in this field for close on 50 years, I can tell you that uh, for 40, 35 at least, we had nothing to change the outcome of melanoma survival, not in metastatic disease setting, not in the adjuvant setting, not in the prevention setting. We now have two dozen agents that I'm not gonna bore you with by reciting now, but the impact in metastatic disease is such that half of people who we would have predicted would have had life-threatening events from their melanoma within a year are now at five years still coasting and dare we speak it, you know, we really begin to think about the hope that these are patients who are cured of this disease, even in the metastatic setting. In the adjuvant arena where Pittsburgh brought the first therapy to bear upon uh, this disease, it was a very toxic therapy that took a year and 168 doses to uh, deliver, cut the risk of relapse by a quarter. But six years ago, seven years ago, we saw the advent of new generation immunotherapies and new generation targeted therapies that cut the risk of relapse by more than half. And the paper that we presented just last fall in Edinburgh, just set off to press this week, shows that the same treatment given a little earlier in disease, what we call stage two B and C, cuts the risk by 58% of relapse. So this is really stellar progress. We've still got lots to do. 
you know, the prevention of this disease from even uh, initiating is something that will be the next chapter and a focus that uh, several of us will devote our time to. But again, the focus of this morning for the next couple of hours is you who are the patients and caregivers uh, and interested uh, folks who may have questions that if we don't address them, we want you to interrupt us, uh, bring us back to task. Um, and basically, um, my hope is that we will uh, answer those questions and make them uh, direct, you know, transparent, uh, simple answers, not convoluted, inscrutable answers. Um, and then um, I think the thanks this morning for our supporters, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, Karen Peterson, who's been a pillar of support for many years, uh, Nick Gentile from Natera, who's introduced a whole new angle on monitoring this disease that we really didn't have before. Mitch Herman from Novartis, uh, who've given us the first targeted treatment that works in adjuvant treatment of melanoma. And Pfizer, who've been there uh, for a long time, uh, Tara and Mia, uh, we thank you for support because it's really a team effort and you're part of the team as well. Um, so this is an AIM and Pittsburgh uh, Cancer Institute, now Hillman uh, UPMC, Hillman Melanoma Program effort. But the partnership with AIM has been a very rewarding one that began back in 2004. Um, and I'm gonna ask Anne to come up from uh, AIM to uh, give the overview and mechanics of this since they've helped with setting that up. And the focus for all of the support that we bring in with this and our walk against melanoma on the 13th at the Boathouse in North Park, which is a lovely venue um, that uh, we will hope to see all of you at as well, is tissue banking. Because without the tissue, um, we don't understand what goes on with these new therapies. The tissue banking is critical to that. The annotation information about the tissues where uh, Mary Horak will talk about the registry and database is crucial to understanding and to moving the field forward again. So um, thanks for coming and Anne, please take it away. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ann Garst-Taylor, and I'm with AIM at Melanoma. It's my great pleasure to represent our foundation here today. For those of you who don't know, AIM was founded 19 years ago by Val Gill when she lost her precious daughter at the young age of 26 to melanoma. And since that time, it's been AIM's mission to end this uh, disease in our lifetime and also to support people who are living with melanoma. And I'll have the opportunity at the end of today's symposium to talk to you a little bit about those supports. But um, between um, now and then, I have two jobs that I need to do. The first uh, very important job is to thank Hillman Cancer Center and Dr. Cookwood and all of our panelists today for the presentations that we will hear. I know that they will be informative and full of hope. Um, so I, we're all looking forward to that. Um, and I wanna be sure and mention Lisa Huntley, who uh, is a mastermind organizer and organized today's symposium. So thank you so much to her. Um, but the second thing that I want to do is to, I know that everyone is going to have questions for today's panelists and I need to explain how we're going to handle that. If you're here with us today, we have given you a, um, a packet of information and in there is a pen and a pad. And if you'll write those questions down, I'll get them to Dr. Kirkwood so that he can answer them for you. But if you're joining us um, virtually, you're coming to us either through Zoom or Facebook or YouTube. If you are joining us through Zoom, then what you will need to do is to, there is a chat feature. You're welcome to tell us where you're from. We love for you to talk with one another, but you need to put your questions into the Q&A tab that's there in Zoom. And if you're joining us through Facebook or through YouTube, then just put your question into the um, chat feature there and we'll grab that and get that to Dr. Kirkwood also. And with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you so much. So our first talk of the day will be from Melissa Wilson, who's been a PA 
uh, now lead PA in the Melanoma Center for many years and is known to almost everyone at AIM because she is the resource person whom all of you uh, who inquire about uh, melanoma and therapeutic questions and other items will reach at the AIM, at the AIM um, uh, website. So Melissa will talk about adjuvant options for stage three melanoma. This is an area where we're still talking about what patients should be treated, what patients uh, perhaps may not need to be treated. Melissa, welcome. Hi. <laughs> So of all the people that you're going to hear talk today, I will be definitely the most informal. So um, we chose this topic basically because it's super relevant. What our goal is, is to prevent you from developing stage four melanoma, because with all the amazing research that we have, um, if we can prevent melanoma from metastasizing in the first place, that's the ultimate goal. So you'll hear later today, one of our other speakers talk about adjuvant treatment in stage two B and C. Um, which is really the newest avenue of where um, adjuvant therapy has been, you know, focused um, for the last couple of years. But that doesn't mean that stage three melanoma really loses its flavor. So we'll talk about that today. So first, what is stage three melanoma? What this basically means is that the melanoma has spread from where the primary is regionally. So it's away from your primary, but it's not distantly metastatic, like in the lungs or in the liver, things like that. This is really lymph node involvement in transit metastases, and then the presence of satellites or microsatellites within the primary. So just to tell you a little bit about what in transit metastasis means, it means that there's a focus of melanoma that's greater than two centimeters from the primary, but still not in the regional lymph node basin. So for example, if I had a melanoma on my arm, um, an in transit metastasis would be somewhere between where it started and your axilla, which is your armpit. Um, Different opposing to that is a satellite um, metastasis, which is less than two centimeters from your primary. So again, to use the same example, if I had a melanoma on my forearm, it would be somewhere within two centimeters of that primary. So that, that's the group that's considered stage three. So why do I need adjuvant treatment? So in both the AJCC 8th and 7th edition, you can see in terms of um, reoccurrence rates, patients with stage three disease have the highest rates of reoccurrence outside of you know, stage one, two, and, and three. Um, what our goal is, is to prevent reoccurrence. That's the number one goal of adjuvant therapy. Um, and so it comes and it happens after surgery. Um, later on today, we'll talk about neoadjuvant therapy and, and the utilization of that. Um, as Dr. Kirkwood said, both immunotherapy or sometimes it's called IO therapy and targeted therapy can reduce the risk of melanoma recurrence by more than 50%. So that's huge compared to what we had when I first started um, in 2005. Um, also, these treatments are very well tolerated now. So we have a, a plethora of options um, in terms of treatment. So what are they? Um, in the terms of immunotherapy, um, we have interferon alpha, which has been the standard, you know, since the 80s. Dr. Kirkwood pioneered that research. Um, again, that, as he said, that treatment is extremely toxic. There's a lot of therapy that needs to be given. Um, and so we've moved away from that with the newer agents. Um, the second drug um, that really was approved for adjuvant therapy is anti-CTLA-4, which is called IPI. Um, or Yervoy, essentially this drug helps take the breaks off the immune system. We'll talk about that in a slide or two next. Um, the unfortunate thing about this is that it does have a lot of toxicity. So these patients develop a lot of autoimmune toxicities that can sometimes be pretty severe. So the second generation of checkpoint inhibitors are the drugs called anti-PD-1 agents, and that's nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And then you have targeted therapy, which are the BRAF MEK inhibitors, which are dibrafenib and trametinib in this stage three setting. I don't want to spend a ton of time on these, but I did want to mention them because this data has been extremely um, beneficial to our um, goal of prevention. Um, for this is an example, I have three slides for the drugs, but um, for Keytruda, um, this Kaplan-Meier estimate for relapse-free survival, so that means that your melanoma has not reoccurred, um, and they looked at it in a three-year analysis in this study, Keynote 054, and they saw that at one year, 75% of people that received therapy did not have a reoccurrence. At two years, 68% did not have a reoccurrence. And at 36 months, there were still 64% of patients that were treated that did not reoccur. So you can see that it's a very durable response. 
The same thing for um, Optivo. Now this curve is a little bit um, tricky, but the information is helpful both for your VOI and Optivo. This is looking at five-year relapse-free survival in Checkmate 238. And you can see that at a year, it's 70% for Optivo, 61% um, for your VOI. Um, at 36 months, it's 58%. Um, 48 months, 52%, and then at 60 months or five years, it's still 50% of people are without reoccurrence. So these, these drugs are great. Um, and then the same thing for the dibrafenib trimatinib at five years. Um, at the four-year mark, you can see that 55% of patients still are without reoccurrence, and at five-year um, mark, 52%. So again, um, these agents are not only effective in the most highest risk, which is in the first two years, but also um, extend their durability two years after. So just a little slide about checkpoint inhibitions. This is immunotherapy. Um, in particular, the rest of my talk is gonna be focused really on PD-1 um, and the targeted therapy agents. So essentially the immune system, <laughs> its job is to get rid of cancer cells, right? So um, tumor, unfortunately, are very smart and they know how to evade the immune system. So they do that through a couple of different mechanisms. I could spend a whole nother lecture talking about that. But essentially in this particular slide, what we're looking at is anti-PD-1 or the anti-PD-1 drugs will help block this interaction between the tumor and the T cells that tell it to hide or that it's okay, that it doesn't exist. And so um, anti-PD-1 actually just unmasks the tumor to the immune system so that it knows that it can be marked for death. That's as basic as I can describe it. And CTLA-4, anti-CTLA-4, its job is sort of similar in that it will block the tumor from preventing the T cell from continuing to interact and make T cells. So it's like taking the brakes off the immune system and you just keep making T cells to the tumor. So how do we give anti-PD-1? It's roughly about once a month. Pembrolizumab can be given every six weeks or it can be given every three weeks. Nivolumab is typically given every four weeks, but also can be given every two weeks. Um, it's the shorter duration, the three weeks and two weeks are just a lower dose. Um, there were studies that showed that there's really no difference between those two groups in terms of toxicity. Um, IV administration for the anti-PD-1 drugs, it takes about 30 minutes to infuse and you do the adjuvant therapy for one year. I put side effects in um, quotations here because there really aren't side effects of the drug, but there can be autoimmune things that can happen. Those are called immune-related adverse events. Really, this can happen in any cell in the body, but the most common ones are dermatitis, which is rash, colitis, which manifests as diarrhea, Pneumonitis, which actually has symptoms very similar to COVID except for fever. So shortness of breath, cough, reduction in O2 sats. You can get hepatitis where the immune system attacks your liver, which causes your liver functions to go up. Um, the endocrinopathies, which are actually pretty more common than we originally thought um, with thyroid, um, either hyper or hypothyroid or um, dysfunction of the adrenal glands. And then there, and one of the things that unfortunately is really difficult to treat is fatigue. This population of patients, um, if it's not attributable to something else, specifically an endocrinopathy or other, other underlying um, itis, um, fatigue can be really limiting for some patients. Um, and then there's another other accountable thing that's like 2% or less side effects, but again, it can happen in any system of the body. You can get inflammation of your, your eye muscles. You can get inflammation of your tear ducts. You can get inflammation of your joints. So there's lots of other things that, that can happen. But these also happen in less than a third of patients. So how do we manage these side effects or IRAEs? Um, it's really steroids. In most cases, it's one milligram per kilogram per day. Um, the steroid taper can be a little arduous. So we try to do a long and slow taper because we want to only do steroids once. We don't want to go up and down on your steroid dose. So that usually lasts about four to six weeks. Um, most of the time patients will discontinue treatment after one of these IRAEs that requires steroids. Okay, so then there's the BRAF mechanism of inhibition or targeted therapy. So the normal pathway of BRAF mech and, and RAS ERK is to cause the cell to grow. So patients that have the BRAF mutation, which the most common one is V600E, um, it tells this cell pathway to happen more frequently. So these tumors tend to grow really quickly. Um, so blocking this pathway inhibits essentially the growth 
and development of, of the cells of melanoma. How do we give targeted therapy? So unlike um, immunotherapy, targeted therapy is actually given orally. You have to take it every day. You have dibrafenib, which is 75 milligrams times two, so 150 milligrams twice a day, and trametinib, which is two, two milligrams once a day. Um, one, some of the caveats, you have to have an echocardiogram and EKG because the MEK inhibitor part of this treatment can actually sometimes affect cardiac function. Um, you have to take it on an empty stomach. So that means that you have to take it one other hour before you eat or two hours after you eat. Again, the duration of treatment is 12 months. Some of the more common side effects of targeted therapy um, are fatigue, rash. Um, the rash actually kind of gets split into two different rashes. So sometimes the rash looks more like hives and that's from the BRAF inhibitor. And sometimes it looks more like acne and that's from the MEK inhibitor. Um, you can have headaches, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, joint pain, blurred vision. These are just the common ones. Um, the one that I didn't list, and I can't believe I didn't list it because it's the hardest one to, to kind of manage is fever. So um, the drug company actually came out with a really good management guide for fever. So if you need that, you can contact me after. I'm happy to share that with you. But um, what the goal is really is to keep patients on the highest doses of these medications. So managing these side effects, even though they're very mild, it's very important that we do this well so that we can keep you know, patients on the higher doses. Now you are able to dose reduce these medications if the side effects are you know, too severe. Um, again, I stated most of these side effects are mild, but some can be severe. You typically will hold drug until it resolves. Um, even though the half-life of these medications are really short, um, sometimes the effects can last you know, a week or two before you start to really feel better. And again, if you have any of these side effects, you can continue at a, at a smaller dose. So in summary, adjuvant therapy is extremely important um, because it does help prevent reoccurrence. There are so many drugs now that are great in metastatic disease, but really this is the root of trying to prevent disease from spreading. Um, really, everyone always asks, like, what treatment should I do? It's really the one that's best for you. You have to look at things like your lifestyle and whether or not you're needle phobic, like there's lots of things that you need to take into consideration. The most important adjuvant therapy is the one that you do. So um, this slide is just kind of a comparison between immunotherapy and targeted therapy. Um, again, you know, immunotherapy is IV, targeted therapy is oral. They both have the same duration of treatment. With immunotherapy, there's not immediate side effects, but immune-mediated adverse events can occur and you need steroids to manage them. Whereas side effects with targeted therapy, most of them are mild. Um, they're managed with dose reductions um, and you can continue therapy if you have any of them. Um, with immunotherapy, there really aren't medication interactions. Targeted therapy, there are some, um, but they're really well, well tolerated. So those are my references and that's it. Have any other questions? I'm happy to answer them. And now I don't know which mask is mine. Hopefully it's this one. So if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to either write them down or uh, grab the microphone at your table. But if not, um, I think we will uh, proceed on. Uh, since Catherine Schmitz uh, is not momentarily here, but hopefully coming shortly. And we'll uh, flip to the video presentation from Yana Najar, our faculty who is talking uh, in, the top, in the talk that follows that on treatment of the situation where PD-1 doesn't work. PD-1 refractory disease is probably the major gap in the field right now. And so it's a, a pleasure to have Yana uh, talking even though she was out of town and she pre-recorded this. So Keith, um, we'll turn it to you to boot Yana's talk up and here it is. Hi everybody, my name is Yara Najar. I'm one of the medical oncologists here at the UPMC Home and Cancer Center, also specialized in melanoma, like so many of my partners from whom you've been hearing uh, this morning. And it's my pleasure to be speaking to you today about updates on immune checkpoint blockade resistant melanoma. These are my disclosures, which should not impact on our discussion. So I'd like to, first of all, try and contextualize this conversation. Historically speaking, the overall survival for a patient with metastatic melanoma in the pre-immunotherapy uh, era 
was under six months and over decades and decades, very little headway was made. Very happily, more recently, you can see here data from uh, Checkmate 067, which was the pivotal clinical trial combining two kinds of immunotherapy, ipilimumab and nivolumab. And you can appreciate that at six and a half years, 49% of patients are alive. So how did we get from A to B? It's really by changing the entire treatment paradigm. From antiquity, really, up until relatively recently, the paradigm was to directly target the tumor with surgery, radiation, and or chemotherapy. Um, currently, however, the way we approach diseases, uh, oncologically speaking, and melanoma in particular, are by targeting the immune system and allowing it to do what it's supposed to do in the first place, which is kill cancer cells. So immune checkpoint blockade, I'm sure you can appreciate, has completely changed the name of the game in oncology and first and foremost in melanoma. And what I mean by that is that all of the immune checkpoint agents were first tested and then first approved in melanoma and since then have been tested in so many other uh, disease indications. So the way we think about treating patients with advanced melanoma in 2023 is generally speaking, almost always to start with immunotherapy. And that's because of the results of the pivotal DREAM-seq trial. And this question asked us, if it, the question we asked here was if a patient has a BRAF mutation, which approximately half of patients with melanoma do, is it better to start with upfront immunotherapy or targeted therapy? And the answer was an unequivocal um, finding showing us that overall survival is superior if you start with immunotherapy, regardless of um, BRAF mutation status, meaning if a patient has a BRAF mutation, we really do prefer to start with immunotherapy rather than targeted therapy upfront. To your overall survival, when patients were treated first with immunotherapy was 71.8% at two years versus 51.5% at two years when we started with targeted therapy. And so the long and the short of it here, I, I don't want us to get lost in the weeds, but what I hope you can appreciate is that there's actually a 20.3 difference in overall survival when you start with immunotherapy. Now, of course, I said half of patients have a BRF mutation, the other half don't. But regardless, this has taught us that upfront immunotherapy is superior. And so when we think about what agents to utilize in this day and age, the decision we're really making is, are we going to treat the patient with the oldest combination, if you will, which is epilimumab and nivolumab? Are we going to treat them with the new kid on the block, which is relaflumab and nivolumab? Or are we going to treat with anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, monotherapy, meaning one drug on its own, such as pembrolizumab or nivolumab? And there's a lot of nuance that goes into that decision. And certainly I think it's a topic for another day. But the point I would like to make is that there are now several options in the upfront uh, setting. And most recently, our first third generation checkpoint was approved. That's relathlimab, uh, which targets lag three, another uh, negative immune checkpoint that also sits on T cells, similar to PD-1 and CTLA-4, which are the targets of the other immunotherapy agents. And this combination was approved on the basis of doubling progression-free survival, meaning how long patients went before the scans showed progression of disease compared to nivolumab monotherapy on its own. Now, I mentioned earlier Checkmate 067, and, and the reason you'll hear us quote this so often is uh, in a lot of institutions, it's one of the agents that's most frequently utilized upfront or one of the combinations rather. We have pretty mature survival data now at 78 months. And we think one of the reasons that this works so well is that each of these drugs is hitting a non-redundant pathway in what we think of as the cancer immunity cycle. So you're not hitting the same target twice. The two punches that you're handing to the cancer are completely separate. And we think this is what makes it so effective. Now, of course, the problem is that even though we've made enormous strides and the overall survival is now 49% at 78 months, which really would have been unimaginable even a decade ago, um, the fact of the matter remains that we've lost 51% of our patients by, by this time point. The other thing I would say is of these 49%, the majority do not uh, have recurrent disease, but certainly some do. And so there's really a very 
important and as yet unmet need for standard of care, second line plus therapy. And when I say standard of care, I mean something that we can mostly all agree works so well that it can be given to patients outside of the context of clinical trial. So patients who develop primary resistance, meaning the uh, immunotherapy never worked, or patients who develop secondary resistance, meaning it's worked for some time and then stopped working, are still a very underserved population outside the context of clinical trial as there is no standard therapy. Now, if a patient has a BRF mutation, we may opt to treat with BRF targeted therapy at this point. But again, uh, as you may have heard, or as you may know, the amount of time that you get before patients progress on BRAF MEC targeted therapy is not ideal. And what I mean by that is the most recent iteration we have of these drugs will yield progression and uh, at 14.9 months in about half of patients. So how can we extend the benefits of immunotherapy to more patients? This is really something my partners and I spend all of our time uh, thinking about. And certainly not just us, but the field in general. And there are many different approaches that are being evaluated, such as uh, different ways of stimulating the innate immune system. We have multiple clinical trials in the space at our institution. Third generation targets LAG3 or relatlimab was just recently approved. There are others under um, heavy investigation. And then um, perhaps um, volume-wise, the most of what you'll see in clinical trials is synergistic combination. So immunotherapy with a different agent, such as targeted therapy, cytokines, vaccines, or um, combining one of the third generation checkpoints with one of the innate stimula uh, stimulatory strategies and so on. And to do this, you really need to take a holistic approach, if you will, to understanding what the, the disease states, not just thinking about the tumor itself, but also thinking about the environment of the tumor, the physical being of the tumor, all of the different cells uh, and pathways that are implicated there. The host themselves, including their gut microbiome, and this is really something that um, Dr. Devar has led the charge with, as, as you'll be hearing about, um, and uh, increasingly trying to get readouts from the peripheral blood, which is appealing because you can sample the peripheral blood with a peripheral stick rather than getting repeated tumor biopsies. So really trying to look at all of this together and understand how we can overcome immunotherapy resistance, which I would argue is the biggest question facing our field. So early uh, hints that the gut microbiome was really heavily implicated in modulating responses to immunotherapy. When you say anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, what we mean by that is pembrolizumab or nivolumab. And this was really very elegant work showing that the gut microbiome was fundamentally different in mice that were responding versus not responding. And this carried over as well into human studies with higher alpha diversity, meaning more different kinds of um, bugs essentially in the gut of patients who responded to immunotherapy versus who did not. And this had implications on how long patients survived without progression of their disease. And this work was led by Jen Wargo out of MD Anderson. And this finding was really taken one step further by Dr. Devar. And I won't get into too much detail because you're going to hear about this a lot more in a dedicated session to this topic later today. But essentially what he did was to ask, can we salvage patients who have ceased to respond to immunotherapy by giving stool from a complete responder, a sustained complete responder to a patient who is not responding. And the idea there, of course, is that you're giving the good microbiome to a patient whose microbiome has just not been permissive to immunotherapy. And in fact, what, uh, what Dr. Devar showed in this uh, very elegant work was that you could, in fact, salvage a proportion of patients who had stopped responding to immunotherapy. Patients who had clearly gone on to progress on immunotherapy when they received a single fecal transplant and a one-time colonoscopy and continued on their immunotherapy, went on to have responses. As you can see here in the blue, a number of patients had stable disease, that's a steady line, and a number of patients had a partial response, meaning at least 30% reduction in their tumor burden. Those are the three patients you can see uh, lower down on the spider plot. And in work that I'm sure Dr. Devar will, will further discuss, 
um, they also showed that there was modulation of the host immune system, meaning fundamental changes in how the immune system interacted with the cancer and with immunotherapy post fecal transplant. Now, one area that we've been very interested in uh, and we've been working on for, for many years and continue to work on is understanding how the metabolism of the tumor cell itself impacts responses to immunotherapy. And this is work that I've done in conjunction with uh, the, the Delgoff lab. And what we've done is sample patients' tumors over time, either at baseline or over progression. We, we have done this for many, many patients over the past several years. And we have shown that tumor cells really behave very, very differently across different patients, which is no surprise. Um, this is very, very well known. But here I'm looking very specifically at the way they um, make energy for themselves, be it through oxygen or, or through uh, glucose utilization. And fundamentally, what we showed is that tumor cells, melanoma tumor cells, that have high oxidative metabolism actually are associated with this very hostile tumor microenvironment, meaning the immune cells there just aren't working as well as they ought to be. And they have what we call an exhausted dysfunctional phenotype, meaning they're not doing their job. They're unable to. We also found that this high oxidative phosphorylation phenotype of tumor cells is associated with uh, hypoxia or low oxygen throughout the tumor. And as a clinician, of course, it really is a big so what until we show that this has uh, implications on treatment outcomes. And we did find that patients' um, survival really appeared to be intimately tied with their tumor cell metabolism. And this is their overall survival, progression-free survival, and how long they responded to immunotherapy. So we took this one step farther to say, well, what's happening to tumor cells at progression? So I showed you in the earlier slide in the upper left over here, um, I, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but in the upper left that there's actually a lot of heterogeneity between patient tumors at baseline. However, here in the figure on the right, uh, the red dots you can appreciate compared to the black, when patients go on to progress on immunotherapy, they are more often than not associated with this high um, Oxfos phenotype. So we think that there's essentially a selective pressure that is one of the many, many ways that melanoma tumor cells escape immunotherapy. We think that melanoma tumor cells with this high oxidative metabolism are able to um, clonally expand and escape the effects of immunotherapy. And, and this has really um, been shown multiple, multiple times uh, in, our, in our patient sample. So we started to think that perhaps mitigating or addressing hypoxia in the tumor microenvironment might be a way to salvage patients who have ceased to respond to anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. And this is a clinical trial that is almost done enrolling at our institution. And it's a phase two trial of nivolumab, which is of course anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, and excitinib, which is a modulator of hypoxia. It's a VEGF receptor inhibitor. Um, and the reason we combine this is exactly I had previously showed you. We think that if we can decrease hypoxia in the tumor microenvironments, we may be able to salvage patients who have ceased to respond. And um, the data, you know, we generally try not to share data before a trial is uh, has completed enrollment. But what I will say is we have seen some patients with uh, partial responses across different subtypes of melanoma, including mucosal and acral, which are notoriously difficult to treat. Um, and also many, many patients who have stable disease, meaning they had previously been progressing and now they're holding steady. So um, certainly uh, I look forward to discussing those data with you when, when the trial finishes enrollment. So what else is coming down the pike? I mentioned our nivolumab exitinib. There are many different strategies looking at hypoxia in the tumor microenvironment, but also we're learning how to rethink older drugs, if you will, such as interferon, high dose IL-2, and various cytokines or, or small uh, molecules in the blood. And this is one of doctors' many uh, claims to fame as the uh, developer of high-dose interferon, which for decades and decades was really all that we had in the adjuvant setting. And so this was one of our earliest signals that interferons are of uh, clinical significance in melanoma. 
And then high dose IL-2, which was approved for renal cell in 91 and then melanoma in 98. And these, um, this modality is associated with small numbers of patients with complete response, but these are very durable. But the toxicity of high dose IL-2 has really limited its utilization. And so there are multiple next generation or engineered IL-2s that are uh, being studied. And the whole idea here, and this is being done in many different ways, is to maximize the efficacy and minimize the toxicity by basically engineering the molecule to bind to the receptors you want it to on the good cells and not bind the receptors on the bad cells. And the thinking here is that you will be able to significantly minimize toxicity, which is really the rate limiting step with these agents. And you can see here a figure, which I think does a good job of outlining that there are multiple ongoing trials of various cytokine combinations, um, including IL-2, interferons, IL-12. Some of these are injected directly into the tumor and so on and so on. So really a huge field. One of these is nemvalucan alpha, which I include here because we have seen some recent data and the molecule is um, engineered in order to bind to the good receptors. And what I mean by that is the intermediate affinity receptors on the immune cells. And it's really not binding to the higher affinity receptors on cells like T-regulatory cells. And we think that when they bind with T-reg, that's really where you run into all of the toxicity. So you're getting the good without the bad in theory. And this has shown increased numbers of intratumoral and peripheral blood um, effector cells. And perhaps <clears throat> most importantly, durable anti-tumor activity. And I think this is particularly interesting because there have been also responses in mucosal melanoma, again, a subtype we often think about as harder to treat. Um, and so there's now a global study enrolling both mucosal and cutaneous melanoma, which I think as an investigator is, is refreshing because oftentimes you do not see these um, subtypes included together. Mucosal is not as responsive and so it's often not included. So um, I, I was glad to see that both are uh, enrolling here. And there are two cohorts and uh, again, the clinical readouts pending here, but this is the artistry six trial. And I think it's an important trial in this space. Oncolytic viruses, this is not a new concept. Um, you know, as a historical footnote, it's fascinating. People were injecting different bacteria, different viruses to try and get the host immune response to deal with that. But at the same time, you would also have shrinkage of tumors sometimes. So TVEC is uh, approved by the FDA for unresectable melanoma on the basis of an overall response rate of 26%. And there are many agents now being evaluated to try and do better than this, if you will. One of these uh, is a trial being led out of Pittsburgh. This is Luminos 102. It's a poliovirus uh, clinical trial that's enrolling at multiple sites throughout the country in combination with anti-PD-1 immunotherapy in one of the arms. Um, and I will show you, uh, if, you'll, if I can have your attention on the lowest part of the figure, you can see that we have seen some responses in injected and non-injected lesions, which is really important because that's one of the issues really with TVAC. You don't often see responses in non-injected sites, which has limited its, its utility. So this is a trial, um, again, that is, that is enrolling without mature data yet. The IGNITE trial, we very recently saw data from, this is RP1. Uh, a herpes virus that is being uh, developed by Replimune. And the IGNITE trial has multiple different cohorts. And, and again, I don't want us to get lost in the weeds, but what I want to draw your attention to is that uh, the patients here had progressed on anti-PD-1 either in the adjuvant or the, in the metastatic setting. And if you put all these cohorts together, you can appreciate that 36% of patients had an objective response, meaning eradication of their tumor or significant shrinkage of their tumor with a disease control rate approaching 50%. Uh, I think this is particularly important because it appears to be pretty well uh, tolerated. And of course, uh, we'll have to see where this goes uh, moving forward. But I think this is another interesting agent when we think about what's next for immunotherapy resistance melanoma. This is also injected into the tumor, just like the, the oncolytic viruses I had shown you previously. 
The timing and duration of prior anti-PD-1 therapy for patients who are responding, I think, is also interesting because you can see that most patients who had responded to the RP1 agent had previously progressed relatively quickly through immunotherapy. So that's a nice salvage option because we know patients who progress quickly on immunotherapy, we really worry about those folks because you know, with no standard second of line, the question becomes if the disease is moving so quickly, what can I do? So when you see something that works in a patient who's previously rapidly progressed, that's very reassuring to us as clinicians. And uh, very, very important uh, as well is not just to consider whether or not patients are responding, but how long are they responding for? And that's what we mean when we say a durable response. And you can see here, 85% of responders are uh, have an ongoing response. Again, you can see here, um, very important, as I had shown you uh, previously, if for the other agents here too, you can see there are responses in uninjected lesions. So up here, this is the liver, there's a metastasis uh, at the center, um, and you can see over time, this lesion is shrinking. You wanna be looking down that column. And then uh, across each of the rows are different metastases that if you look down, you can see are shrinking with repeated injections. Now, if you were to ask us, what do we think is going to be the most immediately approved agent? I think most of us would venture an educated guess of adoptive cell therapy, although of course this is still under review and we really don't know, but I think the data bears uh, discussion because it's good data. And so when I say adoptive cell therapy, what we mean by that is removing the tumor from a patient, separating out the immune cells, growing them by the billions in the lab, the patient comes into the hospital, gets chemotherapy for about a week, and then we give them back their own immune cells. And then we start to give them high dose interleukin-2, up to six doses to really try and boost that immune response. It's a pretty involved modality, but on the other hand, it's a one and done modality, if you will. And so this is the C14401 study um, that was led by uh, iAvance. And the point I want to make here is that they have various cohorts, uh, but these are PD-1 refractory patients. I also put this little um, box on the side as a historical footnote, because you can see that what we're doing in 2022 really very, very closely mirrors what was being done in the mouse models by Steve Rosenberg uh, in the 80s uh, at the NCI, and when, when this modality started to be developed. So um, looking here at the baseline disease characteristics, I want to draw your attention to a few things, which is that both cutaneous and mucosal uh, melanoma were permitted. Patients um, did have, uh, they, they did include patients who had metastases in the liver or the brain. We, we think of these as distinct populations because they're harder to treat. Um, a significant number of patients had uh, an elevated LDH, also an important prognostic marker. And the number of prior therapies on average, or the, the median number of prior therapies, excuse me, was three. That's very important because it tells you that this is a patient whose disease has progressed on many different agents. And so when you see responses here, it's especially meaningful. And the objective response rate is when you combine two of their cohorts, um, which are treated the same way and which have very similar, um, uh, very similar inclusion, if you or very similar baseline demographics, the RR is 31.4. Again, this is a durable response, which is very uh, important to us when we think of the significance of a modality. A very new modality that's being looked at as well are so-called bispecific agents. And if you look here on the left hand, you can see what I mean by that. So it's essentially a molecule with two different arms, usually one that is hitting a target or binding a target on the tumor cell and the other that is binding a target on the immune cell. And tabentafosp is the first to have been approved by the FDA for treatment of advanced uveal melanoma in patients who have the right immune uh, subtype. And what I mean by that is HLA0201, which is about half of patients. And I think this is meaningful, first of all, because the class of drug itself has been around a long time and it's using a lot of hematologic malignancy, but we're starting to see it come more and more to the forefront in solid tumors. And tabentafos was associated with 20% overall survival in patients 
uh, treated with it compared to the control arm. There are various bispecifics being evaluated at our institution. This charge is being led by Dr. Devar, including uh, a PRAIM protocol that has so far shown us nice preliminary data, but with more mature readouts pending. So this is definitely another space to watch in IO refractory melanoma. And Tabentafos, which is approved in UVL, is actually being evaluated in an ongoing clinical trial in combination with immunotherapy in patients with skin melanoma who have progressed on standard treatments. So where do we go from here? I, I, I hope I've given you a flavor of the different classes of drugs and modalities that are being investigated for patients whose melanoma has not responded. Very happily, half of patients never even need to think about this if they're treated with dual checkpoint blockade, apilimumab and nivolumab up front, but not every patient gets that modality. And even of those that do have gone to progress. So in addition to the different classes we discussed, a very, very important topic we spend a lot of time thinking about are different biomarkers. Think of a biomarker as something that can give you a hint of what's going to happen. So a predictive biomarker will tell you whether it can help you predict essentially whether or not a patient is going to respond to treatment. Um, it would be wonderful to have a predictive biomarker to identify who's going to have toxicity so we know who to treat with what. Uh, and so on, and, and which patients need more intense therapy, which patients can have de-escalated therapy. So this is a huge topic as well in our world. And you get the sense from everything I've shown you that there's really a million different combinations in theory that you could move forward with, but we need to be really thoughtful about you know, so-called rational combinations. And what I mean by that is sound preclinical scientific rationale for combining agent A with agent B. You can't just throw everything at the wall and hope something sticks. In addition to the obvious uh, issue of resources, the most important thing is there are patients going on these trials. And so we'd better have really good reason to believe that it may work. So thinking about tumor biomarkers has really changed a whole lot over time. And the reason I'm taking a minute to talk about biomarkers is because when we think of the next wave of clinical trials and everything I've shown you now, you could argue all this has happened because of particular biomarkers within the tumor and within the host that we think are of clinical significance. And it's that biomarker that drives us to think, well, let's combine A with B or B with C. And this field is changing so quickly. And I think it's becoming really more focused and more narrow over time. And what I mean by that is we're not taking such, um, we're not taking a look at the forest, if you will, we're really starting to look at the trees. So in the past, we used to look at mutations. We used to look at uh, PDL one which is just there on the tumor. We used to look at signatures of the tumor as a whole, you know, the simplistic view of a cold tumor versus a hot tumor. But what we're doing increasingly is to look at different neighborhoods, cellular neighborhoods within the tumor microenvironment. We're looking at areas where different immune cells are uh, within the tumor, tertiary lymphoid structures, we're looking at the gut microbiome. We're looking at the whole host, not just the tumor uh, itself. And when we're looking at the tumor itself, we're looking at it very specifically with single cell sequencing of different immune populations, et cetera. And so uh, over time, as we refine all these modalities, our hope, of course, is that the hypotheses that we generate are more specific and more apt to show clinical utility. So the roadmap for the future, as I think about it really, is to go on to develop these rational combinations by first taking a look at the tumor itself. Are there immune cells there? Are there not immune cells there? And going from then to think about what are different effectors or targets that might make sense for this patient based on the phenotype or of their particular tumor. Once you look at the tumor itself, you can get a sense of is a problem that you just don't have enough immune cells there? Is a problem that the immune cells are sequestered to the periphery, unable, unable to penetrate into the tumor, and so on. And so in time, we should be able to fine tune the choice of agents based on specific targets, specific molecules, and genes and cells identified within the tumor microenvironment of each patient. And then when resistance develops, to then do this again, it becomes an iterative process. Take a look again at the tumor itself and decide where to go from there. Now, of course, it's not so black and white, nor is it so simple. Tumor heterogeneity, meaning different regions of the tumor look different, um, is a huge issue. But again, I'm trying to give you a sense of 
where the field is moving. And so with that, I hope I've given you a flavor for what's really a, a big topic. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person due to family commitments. Thank you so much for your attention and please don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions at all. Well, that was a lovely talk from Dr. Najjar and she's of course not here to answer questions, but one question came in apropos of her discussion of fecal microbiome transplant, transplant of the bugs in your gut to reverse PD-1 resistance. And the question was, how much time is required to increase the microbiome in the gut? And since I know Dr. Devar is gonna be talking about this uh, in his talk, I'm gonna defer that for the moment because you'll hear a lot about that still. Uh, the second question came in about uh, Melissa's talk earlier, which had to do with, for comparison purposes, in stage three, what is the survival rate at five years with no treatment? And you may recall the slide that Melissa showed from 2018, uh, Jeff Gershenwald's paper, of all of the different substages, 3A, 3B, 3C, which had outcomes. But a better answer for you is the answer that our statisticians give us. And at the risk of boring the daylight out of you, <laughs> I'll tell you that the statisticians give us what we call hazard ratios, which are the likelihood that a person who gets a new trial intervention will not relapse as opposed to relapse. And that's where, as I alluded to in the very beginning, our first therapies cut that risk by a quarter. That means they had a hazard ratio of 0.75. The more recent therapies have had a hazard ratio of 0.65, better, so 35% reduction in the likelihood of relapse. And the most recent therapies have had 53 to 58% reduction, hazard ratio of 0.42 to 0.48. And so we're making progress. And the good news is those new treatments which have those smashing hazard ratios, those huge impacts upon relapse have less toxicity, less acute, acute toxicity at least, than those treatments that we had before, which only cut the risk by a quarter. Um, so I'll leave that. Uh, there is on the slide from Gershenwald, um, the absolute numbers, but I think uh, that's uh, you know basically uh, an answer from the statisticians who are other unsung heroes of our operation that really digest all of this data and try to give us the most reliable data on the impact of the treatment compared to the group that got placebo or didn't get treatment uh, in the earlier days. So the next talk we have is really a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, offer to you. Uh, Catherine Schmitz is a professor who has been recently recruited to the Hillman Cancer Center from uh, Penn State, had previously been at Penn, and is really an international authority on the role of exercise in health and in treatment and in cancers. And basically, um, this relates very closely to Dr. Najjar's, which we had accelerated because we were moving a little quicker than we had anticipated, but in fact is a perfect segue from the trial uh, results that Dr. Najjar presented. And so welcome, Dr. Schmitz. Thank you so much for coming to talk about the role of exercise in the treatment of cancer and its prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. And um, I apologize, I thought that I was early actually, and apparently somebody went a little fast with their talk. So, um, so I, I, I gave my title a pre-title and that is, but I'm so tired because generally when I talk to people living with and beyond cancer about exercise, one of the things I hear is, what is it you don't get about the fact that I'm so tired? Why would I exercise? And I'm hoping that I can show you some data that will convince you that it might be worth your while anyway. So as an overview, um, we're gonna move a little bit. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to something called exercise snacks. So if you're not an exerciser at all, um, this is sort of your um, gateway drug um, into maybe thinking about a little bit more movement. And then I'm gonna talk about why you should exercise. Part one, uh, exercise, cancer prevention, cancer treatment, and then we'll talk about part two, exercise to treat symptoms during and after treatment. We'll do another exercise snack. And then I plan to spend the second part of my time with you all, hopefully inspiring you um, and showing you some stories about other uh, patients who have uh, found their way to exercise as they've 
gone through their own cancer journey um, and hopefully it'll be helpful to you all as well. Okay, so our first exercise snack is a chair stand. If you are able to, to stand, great. If you are not, you're going to squeeze your butt cheeks, okay? So uh, I don't know, can I still be seen if I come over here? Do you think? Probably not? Okay, well then you're gonna have to use the picture. So everybody stand up, please. And you'll see what the picture is. You're basically sitting to your chair and coming back up 10 times. Here we go. And down and back up. And I am squatting back here Two. <laughs> you can't see me, but I am squatting three and up four and up five. You can keep my hand going six, <laughs> seven. The video of this is going to be hilarious, John. <laughs> Eight. Nine, last one is 10. Okay, give yourselves a hand, have a seat. So exercise snacks, the idea behind an exercise snack is that it's a short burst of exercise that you would do throughout the day. They're one minute workouts, fun-filled bite-sized exercise events. The idea is if you're like, nope, not an exerciser, it's fine. Do five exercise snacks during the day. You've done five minutes of exercise that's more than you would have done otherwise, okay? So we'll do another one before I finish. All right, so the epidemiologic evidence is compelling, extremely compelling, telling us that there are associations between physical activity and incident cancer, even after we adjust for body mass index for obesity. So what I'm showing on this slide is data from the largest pooled study that was done combining data from 1.8 million individuals across North America and Europe, uh, led by Steve Moore from the National Cancer Institute. And what they were able to show, if you look at the vertical line, ooh, that's interesting. If you look at the vertical line uh, at where it says 1.0, that would be saying that there is no association between the uh, physical activity level and the cancer listed on the left. If on the other hand, you see that something is on the left of the line, which all of these are, you can see that all of these cancers, the incidence of all of these cancers is reduced as a result of being more physically active. Interestingly, what's not on the list pointedly, given what we're doing today? Melanoma. Melanoma is not on the list because in fact, the risk of melanoma is increased with physical activity. Can you guess why? Sun exposure sun exposure. So people who are more physically active are more likely to be outside. They're more likely to get more sun exposure. It has nothing to do with the physical activity. Okay. So uh, there's also evidence that exercise is associated with reduced risk of cancer specific mortality for three very common cancers, breast, colon, and prostate. And those percentage differences are huge. Those are very large effects of being more physically active and reducing risk of cancer specific mortality. There are a number of proposed mechanisms and this is why uh, Dr. Kirkwood's comment about the timing of the two talks is absolutely perfect. Um, there are a number of proposed mechanisms that we would uh, uh, expect to be the reasons why exercise would have an effect on incident cancer. And they are the very same pathways that you just heard in the prior talk. The one that's not on this list, but I have data to show that exercise does affect the gut microbiome. And so it affects the gut microbiome, it affects immune response, T cells in particular, natural killer cells in particular, in particular. It affects metabolism, it affects tumor physiology, the tumor microenvironment is altered. The entire hormonal milieu around the tumor is altered as a result. All of the signaling cascades are changed as a result of exercise training, gene expression is changed as a result of exercise training. And that oxygen, that hypoxia that was talked about in the prior talk is altered dramatically as a result of doing exercise training. There was a beautiful review that was done on this topic by Proya Hoyman uh, in 2018. And what you can see on the top of this slide are three pairs of people, a man and a woman. And on the left side, they've got kind of a pudge um, and they're not very physically active. Um, and in these people, the expectation is that there is some small amount 
of metabolic disturbance and low-grade inflammation, which alters the tumor microenvironment as well as the systemic environment and the perfused environment uh, in a manner that alters cytotoxic immune function, metabolic health, uh, and perfusion to the tumor. If we do an acute exercise bout, we know that we activate natural killer cells, and we know that we alter reactive oxygen species induced cell damage. If we become regularly physically active, we are exercise trained, we have improved, excuse me, cytotoxic immune function and improved metabolic health. You just heard about the metabolism of the cell and that this metabolism of the cell is vitally important to our understanding of the response of melanoma cells to the treatments that are provided. One of the other things that is just wicked cool that came out of MD Anderson, actually it came out of my lab at Penn and then the postdoc moved to MD Anderson, um, is some beautiful animal work that shows that we alter perfusion of tumor cells. We alter the way that the blood vessels perfuse the tumor cells in a way that alters the likelihood of the cell getting the chemotherapy that we're trying to get to the, the tumor by doing regular physical activity. And I'll show you more data about that in just a moment. Um, I do wanna show you in that same review by Hoyman, um, there was a summary of uh, if you do voluntary wheel running uh, in, in uh, rodents, do you reduce tumor growth ac across a broad range of histologies, including melanoma? And one of the things that I find just fascinating is that the size of these effects, look at the size of these effects. Dr. Kirkwood just told you, we're doing a better job of getting the kinds of responses that we were getting 25% response, then we got 35% response. We can reduce tumor growth with exercise in a rat by 67% by doing a regular exercise program in that rat. So this is the data that I was uh, talking to you about that actually was uh, gathered at uh, the University of Pennsylvania when I was running a large U54 there. Uh, Carrie Shadler was the postdoc that led this work. Um, the graph on the left relates to melanoma cells and the graph on the right relates to uh, pancreatic cells. And I need to walk you through this and tell you, you know, what happened. So what they did was they had four groups of animals one group of animals did nothing. They did no exercise, they were given no chemotherapy, and that's the black circles. You can't even see them because they're buried in the, in the plot. Um, there was a group that was given just exercise, no chemotherapy, and that's the red squares, and you can see that's a bad idea. We don't wanna replace chemotherapy with exercise um, because that's gonna allow the tumor to go with unchecked growth, okay? Um, what you can see is the black triangles are what happened to the growth of the tumor over 15 days um, with just doxorubicin, just, just the chemotherapy that was offered to the animals. But what you can most pointedly see is that the growth of the tumor is least in the animals that received an exercise intervention at the same time that they received the chemotherapy. And they were able to go back and take samples of the tissue from these animals and discerned that in fact, what was happening was that exercise was causing shear stress in the uh, blood vessels of these animals in a way that caused improved perfusion of the tumor so that the chemotherapy drug was better able to get to the tumor and treat the tumor. So I stand before you, perhaps the first person talking to you about the field of exercise oncology, but I am not alone. This is not a new field. This is a field that started in the 1940s at the Wistar Institute with some very surprised scientists who did some exercise in rats, thinking that they were stressing the animals and thinking that the rats were going to have increased number of tumors and increased tumor growth as a result of stressing the animals. Imagine being in that lab on the day that they realized that in fact their experiment had gone the exact opposite direction. So experiments have gone on like that since the 1940s. In the, in the 1980s, the first human clinical trials in exercise oncology were done at the Ohio State University by nursing scientists. And the field has slowly grown 
over the course of the 1990s and the 2000s. I wrote the first meta-analysis in this area in 2005. Uh, we had an ACSM roundtable, American College of Sports Medicine roundtable in 2010 to draw some conclusions and look at the data to say, what should we be recommending to people living with and beyond cancer? Uh, there was a 281% increase in the number of randomized controlled trials in this field between the first ACSM roundtable and the second one in 2018. And if you were to search what's called PubMed, um, and you can just Google for PubMed to look where the scientists look for their scientific publications, and you were to search on exercise, cross it with cancer, say human English clinical trials, you would get over 2,600 responses today. Now, maybe there are people who've published two papers on one trial, so let's say it's over a thousand still. This is not something I invented this weekend in my garage. So what about the other cancer health-related outcomes? It's not just the incidence of the cancer that we care about. We also care about symptoms, treatment tolerance, and adverse effects of treatment. Well, great news, there are guidelines. So I am very proud to have been the person who has spearheaded the American College of Sports Medicine guideline process from 2010, as well as 2018. Um, but the American Cancer Society followed us in 2022. Um, and very importantly, uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology released their guidelines in 2022 as well. There are two things to say here, one is, if you were to go back and look very carefully at the names listed in all of these publications, they barely overlap, but they all draw the same conclusion. That's really important. That tells you that this is a robust conclusion. The other thing that I think is awesome is that ASCO came forward with strong language. They said oncologists should, based on the data, should be referring their patients to exercise to deal with symptoms and side effects during their treatment. So what does exercise do for patients as they go through their cancer journey? We know that exercise is the number one treatment for cancer-related fatigue. So, but I'm so tired, the number one treatment better than any pharmacologic agent available on the market for treating cancer-related fatigue is movement, is simply getting out of your chair and moving a little bit. Health-related quality of life is improved, physical function. So physical function, what the heck do I mean by physical function? I mean your ability to pick up a box and carry it across the room. I mean your ability to carry your grandchild. I mean your ability to get on the floor because you forgot that you needed to get something underneath the couch. Uh, I, I mean, you know, wheeling your suitcase down uh, the, the hallway to be able to travel somewhere to see a, a loved one. I mean your ability to carry your groceries, uh, your ability to make your bed, the ability to do the things that you need to do in order to function in your life and be independent. Anxiety and depression are made better by physical activity. Sleep is made better by physical activity. Breast cancer-related lymphedema is made better by uh, uh, physical activity. We don't have a whole lot of data about uh, uh, exercise and lymph uh, lymphedema in the setting of melanoma, but there is no reason to believe that the data would be different and bone health is improved by physical activity as well. All right, exercise snack two. Everybody stand up. You wanna stand behind your chairs and we're gonna do calf raises. What you can see here is she's lifting her heels. So we're gonna come up on our toes and back down and two and back down and three and back down and four and back down and don't hold on, see what happens. <laughs> I've lost count, like every trainer, right? Seven. Is that seven? seven? Eight, nine, and 10. There you go. So you got a little balance exercise too. All right, well done. Okay, so for the remainder of my time with you, what I really wanna talk about is exercise oncology in action. I wanna give you some stories about people who have found their way to exercise during their cancer journey. And I start with the story of my friend, Bill Jolly, who goes by, by Jolly because he is. Um, and uh, he was invited to do a, a sprint triathlon back in 2011 by a friend. And he was just completely exhausted doing all of the exercise. 
And the quote he had was, I know I'm out of shape, but I sh should I be this tired? Developed something like chest congestion, had no, nothing showed up on a chest scan. He was prescribed albuterol for what they thought was adult onset asthma. Um, a month later, uh, a mile into a run, uh, his friend says to him, damn jolly, I didn't know you had asthma. And he said he was wheezing so bad it sounded like he swallowed a whistle. So PCP ordered a second chest scan and uh, said, it looks like you have an enlarged heart, probably nothing, just an athlete's heart. I'll have my friend who's a radiologist take a look for you. Um, the radiologist recommends a CT, which confirms stage three lymphoma and a biopsy uh, two months later revealed small lymphocytic lymphoma. In January of 2012, he started six rounds of chemotherapy. He, in the same month, started training with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society team in training. Five months after chemo, he completed a marathon. Um, the next year he did an Olympic try. The next year he did an Olympic try in 2018, he did a half marathon. In 2016, he relapsed. He had a remission, uh, four years of remission. Um, uh, he felt an enlarged node under his armpit during a shower and he started oral chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Um, in January of 2017, this is, this is crucial. This is why I title my talk, what I do, increasing fatigue, growing significant. The quote, I felt myself going to a dark place and I didn't like it. I didn't wanna work. I didn't wanna talk to my wife or kids. And after four days of increasing depression, I told my wife at 10.30 at night that I had to go for a run. One mile into the run, my fatigue and depression just vanished. I discovered I could keep the fatigue and depression away as long as I exercised every other day. And in October of that year, he finished his first Ironman. He continues to do Ironman competitions. Jolly allows me to share his story if I share this slide in particular. Jolly's takeaways are that you need to listen to your body, that your body will tell you that something's wrong before the lab tests will tell you that something is wrong. If something feels off, don't ignore it. Be quick to get help from allied health professionals such as exercise, nutrition, and psychology. Medicine and surgery are not the only tools for a cancer journey. Exercise can reduce or eliminate medication symptoms and reduce reoccurrence of some cancers. And very importantly, very importantly, cancer often feels like something that happens to you. I am a cancer caregiver. My wife went through head and neck cancer. I know the cancer can feel like something that happens to you. So this is a way for you to feel that you have a mental victory and you get something back. The list goes on. Sydney Hooper is a pancreatic cancer survivor, Ironman competitor. Susan Helmrich is a three-time survivor. Some of us might be old enough to remember the DES trials and the DES daughters. Uh, she also had lung cancer and pancreatic cancer. She's a master swimmer. Gabriella Grunwald was a patient with adenoid cystic carcinoma who was diagnosed in 2011. While she was an advanced cancer patient, she was a sponsored rank USA track and field runner. She placed just one shy of getting into the Olympics in London while she had cancer. She was the national champion of the 3000 meter while she had cancer. Gabe had a, she has a foundation called Brave Like Gabe she had a, uh, a quote that she went to a lot. There are two ways to live your life. The first is as if nothing is a miracle, and the other is as if everything is a miracle. Mike Levine, uh, pictured on the left as a young man doing Ironman competitions. He was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and told basically, you know, we're, we're done. There's not a whole lot left we can do for you. Um, and uh, you know, he stopped doing any kind of exercise and his friends showed up and said, yeah, let's go for a, a mile long run. Let's go for a, you know, a walk. Let's get on the bike and just tool around the neighborhood. And what he was shocked by was with stage four pancreatic cancer that he had something left in the tank and that he was able to go back and do one more competition. Keegan Randall's story is really dramatic as well. Keegan Randall is a US Olympian. She's a gold medalist from Pyeongchang. She was a phenom in Pyeongchang as it was because first she got a gold medal for cross country skiing against some Scandinavians. Americans never win against the Scandinavians. Um, also because she was a young mother at the time and that's pretty unusual. 
for uh, Olympians at that, or athletes at that level. But when she came home three months after coming home from Pyeongchang, she was diagnosed with an aggressive breast cancer. And she went right into athlete frame of mind. She's made a public commitment to stay active. She rode her bike to and from the treatments. You can go online and, and Google Keegan Randall and see pictures of her doing her exercise while she's going through her treatment, completely bald. Um, and uh, she definitely had bad days. And on those days, she would try to do something for at least 10 minutes. So it's not like everybody's doing a marathon every day. Um, very important quote here, moving helped me feel better physically and more importantly, it gave me a mental victory. She credited feeling uh, physical activity for helping her body process all of the treatments. So her goal now is to raise awareness for this. She and I have partnered on this a number of times. I was president of the American College of Sports Medicine the year that she came and I got to share the stage with her. That was very special. So what I would conclude with is that I think it's time for a paradigm shift. We have this easy, low tech approach to try to improve the health of people living with and beyond cancer that's available right now. And we did a little bit of it today. Exercise is indeed medicine for people living with and beyond cancer. You don't need to do a, a triathlon. You don't need to do a marathon. You don't need to be an Ironman. Taking a 10 minute walk is actually going to make a difference and will make differences physiologically in the very same pathways that are described in the more basic science talks today. Um, I am delighted to tell you that we have started the Moving Through Cancer program at Hillman Cancer Institute, Cancer Center. And uh, if you are interested in more information about this, I hope you'll find me during the break or uh, go check out this website or even Google Hillman and Moving Through Cancer and you'll find it very quickly. Okay, thank you. So I didn't want Catherine to leave the podium because that was such a wonderful talk and thank you. What you heard about from several of the talkers, <laughs> talkers, the speakers before Catherine is that the leading cause of dose interruption, the leading toxicity of targeted therapy, not even the immunotherapy, but of also our immunotherapy, the leading toxicity is fatigue. So you just heard about something that we should have been implementing a long time ago. Several of you in the audience, I won't point to you and name you, but uh, you are avid cyclists. And basically, you know how important exercise is. It's critical uh, really to everything uh, that is the rest of us. And this fits so perfectly following Yana's talk about tumor cell and T cell metabolism. It's your whole body's metabolism that's important. So the question that came in for Catherine that I held her up here for, other than to say thank you, um, is in lung metastasis, how much exercise and intensity is best to favorably alter the perfusion that you right. talked about? Right, okay. So um, the amount of exercise that's useful is, um, uh, you have to, to titrate for your own particular clinical situation um, to make sure that you're not tipping over into more fatigue. So that's where you go. You, you do a little bit of exercise and you slowly progress the time. There's, there's three elements that you progress, frequency, intensity, and the time of the exercise. So you start, if you're doing nothing, you start with 10 minutes of low to moderate intensity, just a simple walk. Don't worry about the intensity right away. Um, and so uh, do that, try to do that every day if you can. Um, if you can't do it every day, do it every other day. If you can't do it every other day, do it twice a week. So try to make your way into the place where you're doing 10 minutes of moderate intensity every day. If your fatigue does not get worse, increase the amount of time. If your fatigue does not get worse, increase the intensity, walk faster, um, do something that's a little bit higher intensity. So, um, so you know, the, the thing that we have to titrate in the same way, I mean, it's not that dissimilar, Dr. Kirkwood, from what we do with our chemotherapy or our, our targeted therapies. How much do you give? You give the amount that the person can tolerate. So what I'm talking about is making sure that you're giving the right amount of exercise to tolerance of fatigue being the key issue. If fatigue is not getting worse, you can do more. 
another question. We're not going to let Catherine leave the podium. <laughs> Basically, the next question is how important is exercising a wide variety of muscles to prevent treatment resistance? Right, right. Okay. So the two types of exercise that have been most studied um, in relation to um, uh, you know, making the tumor not grow more or response to therapy are aerobic exercise and resistance exercise. Um, aerobic exercise has had the lion's share of the research. And so uh, as a result, we focus then on walking because it's the easiest thing to tell you to do. If you want to bike, if you want to swim, that's, those are all fine. Um, as long as your physician is okay with you getting in the water, let's, let's make sure that's okay. Um, so, uh, uh, I think that, um, aerobic exercise, because it has so many systemic effects, um, is probably the first place where I would send people. If you're saying to me, you know, people ask me what kind of exercise is the best kind of exercise to do. And my answer is the kind that you'll do on a regular basis. So if you're listening to me and your answer is, no, I'm really a yoga gal, great. Yoga is your thing, do your yoga. Um, I, I, I never want anybody to walk away from any talk that I give saying, oh, I'm not doing it because I can't do the kind of exercise that I want. Okay, should the exercise be focused on the area of body affected? No. Um, the exercise does not need to be focused specifically on the place in the body where the tumor is. Um, in fact, you want to be doing systemic exercise. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that we want to make sure of with resistance training, um, particularly in people who um, have or are at risk for uh, lymphedema, is that the progression of the resistance is very slow. That's the one other comment I would make. I think I've taken enough time. Thank you. Very much. Thank you so much. We will definitely have you back, I hope. <laughs> so, um, as I mentioned at the outset, part of our goal in our uh, symposia are to highlight the people that you all interact with when you come in, our nurses, our PAs, our faculty, our uh, other associates. But part of the goal really is to highlight the unsung heroes, the people behind all of what we do, who enable all that we do uh, going forward. So it's really a pleasure to introduce Mary Horak, who was my first data manager, how many years ago? I can't even admit how many years ago that was, but who has really been a core of the database system at the Hillman, in the melanoma program, in other programs, annotating the tissues, which I mentioned to you before, are the issue. The tissue is the issue because without it, we don't understand what is happening in the tumor, as you heard from Dr. Najar. And all of that data either makes the tissue useful or without it makes it useless. So Mary, thank you for coming to talk. I think you'll all learn a little bit about the heavy lifting that goes on behind the scene. And uh, Mary, thank you for doing it. Thank you. Hopefully I live up to that wonderful introduction. So thank you. Uh, so I am here to talk to you about tissue banking and data, and I am on the clinical side, so the lab is definitely not my forte, but I hope I can bring this together for you. So to start, what is tissue? So tissue is a group or layer of cells that work together to perform a specific function. So we might think of our skin as a tissue. However, we also have other things in our body that are tissue that aren't just tumor tumor samples, for example. So we have blood, urine, stool, all of those are considered tissues in our research. And these samples are also often referred to as biospecimens or correlatives. So why is this important? So you all know tissue is important to make a diagnosis. So what stage it is, those different features, but we also use tissue to find ways to prevent, diagnose, and treat cancer. So tissue research often takes a long time. We need to gather tissue from a lot of patients to compare it. And then we also store this in a tissue bank for future use. So why are tissue banks important? So tissue banks are facilities that organize all of this tissue. So they work to collect it, they store it, they distrib distribute it to other researchers for this science and for this study. And we can use tissue for basic science and then also translational science where we're going from bench to bedside um, for treatments with our patients. So by studying tissue in the lab, 
we're learning about biomarkers, we're learning about molecular signals that our prior pre presenters have talked about, and we're learning about how cancer cells work and how they might respond to different treatments. So basic science often begins with this tissue that we store in tissue banks, which again leads to the development of these new treatments. So how are we using these tissues? So tissue is used to determine how well patients respond to treatments. And looking at that, we're also able to determine how well that treatment works. So we can also work to develop a theory and then use this tissue to support that theory to determine if it's correct. And research with molecular mut mutations help us find treatments that we can target to your, your specific mutations. So BRAF, NRAF, KIT, these are all mutations commonly found in melanoma. So we can use the tissue to drive the research to find those, those targets and those treatments. So how is tissue analyzed? So one of the things we look at is the tumor microenvironment. This is something Dr. Najjar talked about. And the tumor microenvironment is the cells within the tumor, uh, also the cells surrounding the tumor, feeding the tumor. So all of that around your tumor as part of that microenvironment. So it's really important to look at that because we can look at individual markers within the tumor itself, but the whole microenvironment as well. And there's multiple techniques we can use to analyze these tumors. And then we also, each technique gives us a different view. So we need to look at them collectively so we can see that big picture of what's going on in that tumor. So looking at on the left side of the slide, the bottom row is flow cytometry. So this is a way where we can look what cells are present. So it shows us, are these tumor cells, it shows us what cells are present. So we don't necessarily know if they're tumor cells or if they're normal body cells, um, but the confocal microscopies, the top two panels, that shows us what's going on in the, in the tumor. So is it alive, is it active? And we can look at these different um, microscopy and combine them together to get that overall picture. So with the orange arrow, the bright blue means this tumor is active and alive. So looking at these different things collectively, we know which cells are active, which cells are um, metabolizing and um, causing cancer to grow or perhaps spread. Um, the one thing about flow cytometry is we can also use it on blood. So that is something where we can use that to learn more about uh, metastasis and how, again, how the treatments might work in the blood. So we can also analyze tissue to look at biomarkers. So these biomarkers, again, are something that Dr. Najjar talked about. Um, looking at, we can look at groups of patients to see does this subset of patients have a response and this can allow us to develop targeted therapy. So this is an example of this kind of science that led to the PD, PD-1 treatments by looking at how these um, biomarkers interact. So we can also use tissue to determine treatment response. So uh, the slide on the far left is normal tissue, and then the slide in the middle is a complete pathological re response to a treatment, and then the far right is a pathological non-response. So what is about this patient in the middle that their tumor responded? Um, and this work is actually from Dr. Najjar as well. So kind of looking at this in the last three slides, first we start started looking at the tumor itself, then kind of patients that have certain expressions. And now we have a particular patient, how did they respond? So with that, we can develop these clinical trials. So the goals of clinical trials are really to develop treatments for our patients. They are written by researchers and biostatisticians who ensure that we have measurable outcomes that we can analyze. So we wanna make sure it's something that we can compare to really get, is it, is there something statistically significant happening? So these objectives and endpoints are the scientific questions we're aiming to answer. And these objectives drive the data that we need to collect and safety and efficacy. So is the treatment safe and how well is it working is commonly primary objectives for our clinical treatment trials. So again, safety is assessing adverse events. So those are the side effects. And then efficacy is the disease response. So is the patient's cancer getting better, staying the same or getting worse? So what data do we need to do this? So clinical characteristics are really important because we have to look at these in conjunction with the tissue analysis to determine the 
effectiveness of the treatment or the nature of the cancer. So this is something Dr. Kirkwood referred to. Uh, we need that big picture. Um, otherwise you just have tissue and you can't correlate it to anything. So common data collection information includes uh, demographics like gender, race, age, the date of diagnosis, the cancer and tumor characteristics, mutations, um, prior treatments, uh, medical history, baseline problems, medications taken, because we're looking at this to, again, look at patients to kind of tease out which ones, why are we seeing the responses we're seeing. So uh, for safety, the adverse events, um, when Melissa was talking about, you know, all those common side effects we see, this is the research that allows the investigators you know, across the country to say, these are the side effects we expect to see in our patients. So for any of you who've been on our trials, your nurses probably have gone through your side effects and asking all of those probing questions of how, how tired are you? Are you able to, you know, get dressed? Are you able to make your bed? We use a tool where we grade these based on a very standard system to make sure that we are assessing all the side effects the same way and we can assess them across different patients on a particular trial. And then our physicians are the ones who are determining what the cause of that side effect is. So is it related to the treatment or is it related to some other cause? So if a patient falls, did they fall because they're clumsy and they tripped or did they fall because their treatment made them dizzy and they, you know, they fell for that reason. So that's how we're assessing these, these side effects for, for safety. For efficacy, we're looking at how the disease is responding. So is it staying the same, getting better? So um, if you remember in Dr. Najjar's slide, she had a, an image of scans with patients' disease. Um, it looked like maybe a liver of different um, sizes. So this is how we correlate this. So we measure the tumors on those images and we compare them from baseline. So on the, on the left, we have a baseline scan. So our measurement is 3.37. And on the right, we have a follow-up scan, so that's 2.3. So that disease has gotten smaller. So we have a standard system we use again to determine what that response is. And in this example, would be a partial response. And this again is how we're determining how the patients are, are doing. So we compare this across all patients on that study to determine the overall effectiveness of that treatment. So what do we do with this data? So we have to put it in a database and there's many different ones that we use. Medidata Rave is one, Inform is one, RedCap. So these are common databases that researchers across the country use. And in this example, we're just kind of seeing the snapshot of the different fields that we're collecting. So we have baseline information. So past treatment, past medical history, um, if, the, the adverse events we're collecting, so all those side effects we're seeing, um, concomitant medications. So are these patients taking other medications? Are you taking metformin or Tylenol? We, we like to look at that to see, again, if there's any correlations. Um, response, follow-up, all of that information we're, we're capturing. One thing I wanted to note, we always capture this information by a subject ID. So any patients in our trials, we aren't putting your name in these databases. It's, it's a unique number that we're, we're tracking you by. So what else can we learn? How can we put this together? So while the main objective of many of our treatment trials are safety and efficacy, secondary objectives are often involving tissue research. So these objectives are used to determine how the treatment is changing the body's immune system or the tumor itself. And then I should note, we do have studies that these um, tissue kind of based objectives are the primary objectives, um, but in many of our studies, they're also the secondary. So the goal of these objectives, again, is to forward the science so we can develop better treatments um, or understand even why certain treatments aren't working. So what patients do, do not see treatment uh, responses with. So again, how does this come together? So the data from the tissue analysis is correlated with the clinical data that we were looking at. Um, and the biostatisticians are the one that help us kind of do the analysis and see, are we seeing trends? Is it more than just random chance that we're seeing these results? So the analysis can be conducted grouping these patients differently based on their characteristics. So, you know, do when men do better than women for a particular treatment? Does age matter? Also looking at those tissue um, analytics, so molecular mutations, gene expression, biomarkers. Again, we can group these patients in many different ways to really tease out which patients are having the most um, benefit from these treatments. And then once these results are reviewed in the context of all of these objectives, the tissue, 
safety, efficacy, whatever the endpoints might be, we determine how well that treatment worked. So that leads to new treatment approval. So when statistical analysis shows that a drug is safe and effective or you know, meets whatever endpoints, we can submit that to the FDA for approval. And the FDA thoroughly reviews this data before they, they make an, uh, the approval for safety and accuracy. So our work directly contributes to these approvals. So the trials that U of S patients have participated in have led to this. So we have a trial with Dr. Kirkwood who in January, 2022 was approved for uveal, medicine, uveal melanoma. And then one with Dr. Luke for our stage two B and stage three C patients um, with Pembro. So again, our research directly makes a difference in, these, in the landscape of cancer treatment. So why give us tissue? So hopefully I've, I've explained all the important reasons why you should give tissue. So it really contributes to the advancements of science. Uh, your, this helps find a cure. So you are helping us learn more about cancer. It allows you to take an active role in your healthcare. So you learn more about melanoma and the different treatments. And then trial participation is always voluntary. So it's always at will. And then just lastly, a huge thank you to all of you because without you, uh, we. We don't, we don't have our, our treatments, so thank you. And um, I have some references. Any questions? Thank you, Ray. That was wonderful. Um, so that really concludes the first half of our talk this morning. And again, the tissue, which is one of the foci of our effort uh, through AIM, here for the symposium, but also on the 13th for the walk against melanoma, which Catherine will also exhort you to join now. The tissue that we are trying to get is there now in 7,000, a uh, couple hundred patients to be used by investigators like Dr. Devar, like Dr. Nijar, others. It would be useless without the data that Mary works tirelessly to get together to annotate the samples. So this is just a look behind uh, the hood of the engine of the effort that we've all uh, worked hard to make happen. But after all said and done is really as important and is uh, as uh, relevant to all of you. So I think we have now 10, 12. Uh, can we make 10, 20, um, seven, eight minutes uh, for a bio break and um, hydration and uh, a couple of snap, what were they called, Catherine? Snaps. Snaps, thank you. So uh, seven minute snap and we'll see you back at uh, 20 past, thank you.
If everybody could take their chairs, we are approaching the appointed hour uh, or 20 minutes past the hour and would like to try to resume. And um, I'll do a little story while we're waiting for everybody to sit down and take their places. But the patient who actually testified to the FDA who got the approval for uh, interferon is a young lady who was then in her 30s, had four children under five, and basically uh, had melanoma. And she got treated for bulky lymph node metastatic melanoma with that old therapy that we had developed here in the 80s. Um, and apropos of Dr. Schmitz's talk, this patient ran two 10Ks during her year of high dose interferon therapy. And we all know how much uh, that takes uh, from you, but it was what enabled her. And she is still a successful businesswoman in town doing her job and uh, doing her 10Ks uh, in her, now her 60s rather than her 30s. But basically that whole story about exercise is something that we uh, will look forward to bringing to bear. All the data that Catherine showed you, uh, Dr. Spitz showed you, is the kind of data that we will rely upon Mary to get into the REDCap database because we'll be taking samples before and after and asking what's the difference that is associated with the difference in relapse of the difference in mortality that has to do with the tumor cells, the T cells and so forth and so on. But with that amount of sidebar <laughs> to take, uh, we'll turn to an area that's really an enormously controversial area. It's one that actually chewed up a better part of a year of my work um, in a consensus conference that we uh, put together because we wanted to ask, what is the role of gene expression profiling prognostically, predictively? And so what a really brilliant uh, resident who we've had the pleasure to have working in our melanoma program for the last uh, year uh, and who's actually already published several things on his work and is going to present more at ASCO this year, uh, Andrew Knight, will talk about non-invasive detection and gene expression profiling in melanoma. Welcome, Andrew, thank you for talking today. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Kirkwood, and thank you all for being here today. 
Uh, I will not be having you exercise, but hopefully I can still keep your attention with some of the information I'll be presenting. So as Dr. Kirkwood mentioned, I'll be talking about non-invasive detection or detection of melanomas using techniques other than traditional biopsies, and also gene expression profiling, looking at the DNA of these tumors to try to understand how they will behave over time. So to give an overview of what we'll be discussing, we'll be talking about why it's so important to, diagnosing, to diagnose melanomas as early as possible, how we usually go about doing that, how we do that traditionally, and then how we can use some of the tools I'll be talking about today to potentially augment this approach. We then will also talk about looking at the DNA of these tumors a little bit more in detail. Can this tell us what the risk of recurrence is for these patients if these uh, tumors behave more aggressively? So to jump into it, this is information that's pulled from the National Cancer Institute looking at the incidence or the prevalence of melanoma over time. And as you can see, melanoma is on the rise. This is just a 20 year period and we see a significant increase in the number of melanomas that are diagnosed, representing that this is a growing issue and all the more reason that we need ways to accurately diagnose these patients early. To highlight the importance of early detection, it's important to understand the difference in outcomes that we see for these patients, depending on the stage at which they're diagnosed. So looking at this graph, you'll see this blue line at the very top there. That indicates patients with localized disease, disease that's potentially curable with surgical resection. Down at the bottom, you'll see this pink line indicating patients with metastatic disease or disease that is spread distant from the original site. And you can notice the gap between the two, that the blue line higher up on that graph indicates better outcomes, better survival than the patients who present with more advanced disease. Now, one exciting point I will uh, highlight on this graph is that there's a rise in that survival in the pink line in the patients with more advanced disease, which signifies the benefits of these therapies you've been hearing about today. So while there's significant benefits that have been made for these patients, there's still a discrepancy between the patients that present with more advanced disease and those that we're able to catch as early as possible. So how do we go about diagnosing these? There's really the, the main tool that's used is visual inspection. Because these tumors arise on the skin, we have the benefit to look at lesions as they come up and to see if they look concerning. This is looking for the ABCDs that you may have heard of before. And we can simply look with our eyes or look using a tool called a dermatoscope. Uh, and there, there's an example of this highlighted in the bottom left of what one of these looks like, but it really magnifies uh, the lesion and illuminates it so that you can better characterize if this is truly something that looks concerning or not. And using a technique like this can improve diagnostic accuracy, but it does come at the cost of being a specialized tool, something that requires some training and expertise to use. So while your dermatology providers may be very familiar and very comfortable with this, general practitioners, for example, may not. So ideally, in a perfect world, we'd be able to lump patients into really one of two buckets. Either these are lesions that appear benign, in which case we can just watch them, keep an eye on them, which we refer to as surveillance, or they're much more concerning, in which case they warrant a biopsy. But this really underestimates the spectrum of disease that we see for our patients. We have lesions which have some features of a benign lesion, but have some features that are a little bit more concerning as well. And so we have these intermediate risk lesions along the middle. And it's really these lesions that present a challenge of what do we do with them? If you biopsy most of these lesions, then certainly you can catch more melanomas potentially, but at the uh, risk of increased biopsies and uh, any complications that come from that. Of course, if you err on the other side and of uh, not biopsying, you risk missing a melanoma, which certainly none of us want to do. So in practice, what happens with this is that there is considerable variability between different providers, different specialties about exactly which lesions are biopsied and which are not. Ideally, we would have a technique to take these intermediate risk lesions and to stratify them or to separate them into one of the two buckets that I had identified here. So in order to talk about 
how to find these early changes that signify that something is a melanoma or is becoming a melanoma, we need to talk about uh, how those develop. But talking about the limitations of the current approach that we use, as we biopsy lesions, we create risks, even if they're small, of scarring, bleeding, and infection. And so minimizing that while trying to maximize biopsying the uh, lesions that are truly melanomas uh, is key. Additionally, something that is not uh, as commonly talked about is the importance of the right type of biopsy. The American Academy of Dermatology recommends that for a lesion where there's very high concern that it is in fact a melanoma, that it be excised, taking a scalpel to remove the lesion, uh, rather than simply having the lesion uh, be biopsied by a shave technique where just the top layer is removed, because that can risk missing some of the most important information about the depth of that tumor, which is so key in guiding future treatments. And so if we knew better how high risk these lesions really are, it could potentially guide the type of biopsy that we do. And the other thing I'll highlight is that even with trying to be cautious and biopsy lesions, as they appear concerning, there are melanomas that are missed. We'd like to think that we don't miss any, but we know by looking back that we do. And depending on the study you look at, the sensitivity of a dermatologist is somewhere in the range of around 75 to 80%. And for routine examinations by a general practitioner can be considerably lower because of all of the other medical issues they're trying to address. One study quoting as low as in the 40% range. So it's important that we have techniques to try to increase that sensitivity. So I said we would talk a bit about the changes that occur in melanoma over time so that we can try to detect these at the earliest stage possible. And so one of the first changes that happens in any tumor, uh, but in melanoma as well, is a change in the DNA. So we're familiar that sun exposure is of course a risk factor uh, for developing melanoma, and this is because of the damage to the DNA. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, you can think of it as the DNA as the blueprint for a tissue, how it behaves, sort of the, the guidebook of how it will uh, behave and act over time. And changes in this can cause these tissues to act as cancerous lesions rather than simply uh, benign ones. So as, these, uh, as this damage occurs to the DNA and these mutations develop, we can eventually see as these lesions grow and change on our examination, but that is a later development. And so if there's a way to look at these genetic changes early on, it potentially opens an avenue to diagnose these patients at an earlier stage. I'm gonna highlight three genetic mutations that have been identified to be particularly useful for this purpose. Uh, you can see the full names here, which I won't read out, but essentially I'll be referring to these as link, prime, and a mutation in a portion of a gene called the TERT promoter. And these genes were identified to be, uh, the link and prime genes were identified to be more highly expressed in melanomas than in benign lesions. So this led a group of researchers to develop something called the pigmented lesion assay. And UPMC's own Dr. Laura Ferris has done a lot of work in this area to try to bring this to the clinic. Unlike a traditional biopsy where tissue is removed, this is a simple adhesive patch that is firmly applied to the lesion and then removed where a thin layer of cells will be taken away and can be sent to look for genetic changes to determine if this is something that we should send for biopsy or something we can potentially wait on. So how good are these tests? I'll highlight the first generation of this test, the PLA, uh, which looked at just two of the three genes I mentioned. And it showed that if changes occur in one of these two uh, genes, that if these genes are more highly expressed, that that will pick up 91% of melanomas. So if, there, if the lesion is in fact a melanoma, in other words, that is a 91% chance that that test will come back positive. They didn't stop there though and look to see, can we make this better? Because 91% is good, but if we could get it to be even higher, we could feel more secure about trying to guide our management in this way. So this is where the integration of that third gene that I talked about, the TERP promoter, came in to develop what they call the PLA plus or the pigmented lesion assay plus. This improves the sensitivity. It's going from 91% of lesions that are in fact melanomas being picked up by this all the way to 97%. 
And one thing I'll point out here is that a, a particular diagnostic challenge can be these dysplastic nevi, these abnormal looking moles that are certainly can be concerning visually and can sometimes even appear as early stage melanomas on a biopsy. And while the first two genes I mentioned, link and prame, can be overexpressed in these dysplastic nevi, it's rarely the case that they, unlike melanomas, will have mutations in this TERP promoter, again, giving us a way to separate out those two groups. So let's go back to this model that I highlighted earlier about our clearly benign lesions versus our intermediate risk ones, and finally, our very clearly malignant lesions that should be biopsied regardless. The proposed way to use this would not be so much for the lesions that are clearly benign, where we can feel safe just watching them, or clearly malignant, where we know we shouldn't delay and we should go ahead and biopsy, but for these lesions where we're on the fence, essentially. Can we then do a test like this to determine where to send them next? I do want to be clear that this would not be a substitute for a biopsy that if this came back as concerning for high risk, that information we were just talking about from the tissue is so important to guide treatment that the next step would be to do a biopsy, confirm the diagnosis and get more information about the tumor. So the benefits of this, exactly uh, what I was talking about as potential uh, unmet needs for the field is to try to detect these tumors earlier. It's not something that requires specialized training. This is an adhesive patch that can be applied to a lesion, removed and sent off to a specialized lab to do the training. So unlike biopsy techniques that some general practitioners, for example, may not be as comfortable with, this uh, does not require that. And it's non-invasive uh, because it's not removing a significant amount of the tissue. It doesn't open you up to those risks of uh, scarring and uh, infection, that sort of thing. And the goal would be that you could test this and if negative, potentially uh, say to hold off on doing the biopsy right away if you weren't totally convinced and therefore potentially reduce unnecessary biopsies. So I wanna shift gears a bit and talk about another area where genetics uh, can potentially tell us about these tumors. So we saw how it can differentiate or has the potential to differentiate benign lesions from malignant ones. But what if we know the patient has melanoma? Can the genetic changes of that melanoma tell us about how it's going to behave? What their risk of recurrence is or that it is spread somewhere like the lymph nodes where we know melanoma likes to go. So I'll highlight uh, a, a first the way that melanoma is typically excised so we can talk about the principle of recurrence and then talk about how these tests could in the future potentially be useful to guide this. So if in this example, we have a melanoma of this patient's right arm. It's fully excised with the goal of removing all of the cancer that's there. But we know that there's the potential that we're leaving something behind. These are a few cells so small that you couldn't de detect them on an exam, that you can't detect them with any sort of scan. But we know that some of these patients, if the tumors are particularly thick or there's other high-risk features, that there could be something left behind. This is the rationale behind what uh, Melissa Wilson talked about earlier of adjuvant treatment to try to get rid of anything that's left. So it's important though that we understand who is truly at high risk and would really benefit from therapy to try to remove any cancer that's left versus patients that are at lower risk where the toxicity of a therapy could, be outweigh, could outweigh a potential benefit if they are really unlikely to recur. So how can the, looking at the genetics or doing what we call gene expression profiling try to start to answer that question? And I'll highlight one commercially available assay as an example of this, uh, but just understand that these all function similarly. So uh, this example, the Decision DX melanoma test looks at 31 genes in a patient with melanoma that are associated with higher or lower risk of recurrence and creates a score that places the patient into one of four categories from lowest risk up to highest risk. And so if we look at how these patients do over time, depending on the bucket that they fall in, we see something that looks like this. So just to orient you to the graph we're looking at here, as we go over towards the right, that is the patients being followed by, uh, over time. 
and looking uh, at the y-axis or uh, how high these lines are, that is indicating whether or not the patients have recurred. So uh, anytime a patient recurs, that's that line dropping down. Uh, or uh, if a patient dies, of course, that would also count. Now you see that there's a separation. The patients with the lower risk profile have better outcomes than the patients with the higher risk profile. And so it, this highlights that this does have some potential value to suggest uh, the risk of a patient. Uh, Dr. Kirkwood did an excellent job of highlighting that this is a controversial area though, because knowing that a patient is a little higher risk or a little lower risk is not sufficient to answer all of the questions that we have about this. It's important that we understand how these uh, risk categorizations should affect what we do in the clinic. Should we space out surveillance on patients that are lower risk or perhaps do it closer if the patient's at higher risk? And the reality is that those trials really have not been done yet. So we don't fully know the answer to exactly what that would do in terms of a benefit uh, for the patients. If guide, using this to guide our approach would really benefit the patients, that's something that uh, is certainly being looked at and is an attractive option for the future. Uh, Dr. Kirkwood mentioned the uh, Melanoma Prevention Working Group, and I pulled a segment from their statement on this exact topic, highlighting that they are optimistic about the potential use for this, that this could be a tool in the future to narrow in on exactly a patient's individualized risk, but we need those prospective studies. We need those randomized controlled trials to understand if patients should have their treatment or their surveillance modified uh, by a gene expression profile. So in summary, we talked today a bit about non-invasive detection. These are techniques other than biopsy that can put a patient in one of those two categories so we know what to do with them going forward. To try to pick up on every melanoma while not biopsying things that are not melanoma and don't need to be biopsied. And hopefully with this, diagnose patients at an earlier stage and move some of those patients from that pink line I showed you at the beginning up to that blue line at the very top and improve those outcomes. We also talked about the gene expression profiling as a tool to better estimate a patient's risk of recurrence, but highlighting that exactly how we would use this patient in, uh, use this information rather in the oncology clinic is something that still needs to be better determined before we see widespread use of this to change our management. And with that, I just want to acknowledge, of course, Dr. Kirkwood uh, for inviting me to speak today, everyone at the Melanoma Center for all the work that you do, uh, and the Cancer Center more broadly uh, for the work that all of you do, and of course, our sponsors today uh, who help support this event. Thank you, Andrew. And there's already a question for you, so don't go too far. Okay. Basically, this is, uh, does the PLA work for amelanotic lesions? I, I may say that might be a question that you could provide some additional information on as well, because I don't know that I know the answer to that off the top of my head. This is referred to as the pigmented lesion assay, um, and it's traditionally where it would be used. I'm not sure if you could provide some additional information. I, I think there isn't data yet on amelonic lesion, so it was a trick question, because the truth is um, whether frame, link, tert are expressed or not in those lesions will require larger numbers. We will be using this in prospective trials, this uh, tape stripping assay um, with hundreds of patients that we're hoping to enroll to those even as soon as this summer uh, to commence and then we'll have that data, but it's all still a work in progress, but you're absolutely right. Thanks so much. Thank you. So we've heard a couple of times the um, potential importance of the microbiome, uh, microbiome in the gut, the microbiome on your skin, microbiome um, in many other tissues, even including the tumor. And to address this, um, Dr. Devar will speak next on modulation of the microbiome as a way to improve response, the tumor shrinkage rate, as well as toxicity levels in patients on the treatment, uh, the treatments that we've been talking about. Welcome. Welcome. All right, uh, so thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, these are my disclosures. 
Uh, normally, we try to schedule this talk for after lunch so that I have a, an attempt to try to see how many people can stomach pictures of poop and more poop and poop. Um, <laughs> because that's what this is about. It's about collecting poop, analyzing poop, talking about poop, and showing you guys more pictures of poop. But um, the key thing to understand about, about where we come from is um, the work of Dr. Kirkwood and his colleagues have demonstrated over the last 20 years, so that's basically longer than I've been doing this, that immune therapy is basically improved the survival of patients with melanoma. So everything at the bottom is immune therapy, everything at the top is targeted therapy. The stuff at the top improves overall survival. The stuff at the bottom improves overall survival even more. And what we now know is that basically checkpoint inhibitor therapy use is burgeoning. It's growing like wildfire in many, many, many cancers. And for the first time in reported history, just in the last couple of years, uh, what we now know is that two cancers in particular, lung cancer and pertinent to the present discussion, melanoma, have actually, for the first time ever, have reduction in the death in, in reported death rates. So this is transformative because up until now, patients were dying from cancer, but now fewer patients are dying from cancer, primarily because of the advances in therapeutic modalities, such as immune therapy. But as you've heard from some of my colleagues, uh, everything that we use to try to figure out why these drugs work, how they work, has come from a relative limited understanding of primarily looking at the tumor, the host, which is you know, your response to immune therapy, looking at blood, for example, and the genetic characteristics of the tumor as well as the area around it, what is termed the tumor microbiome. Now, as it turns out, we have a completely separate system within us that affects responses to uh, immune responses in general, and that is the gut microbiome. So most people don't really know about this. I'll spend a little bit of time explaining this. So the idea is that all of us are essentially symbionts, right? So if you, if you have a garden, you kind of know this. If you, have, you take care of pets, you kind of know this. But the point is that the human body is not just the human body. It's really the human body, along with a host of other microbes that live within us, that help us do things. These microbes have been co-evolved. So we've inherited them, largely speaking, from our parents. They're, to some extent, whether or not you like your spouse, you share a fair amount of this with your spouse and the people you live with. And uh, we share a tremendous amount of these things with other mammalian species. So there's a lot of conserved ontology of these species, uh, of these bacteria within species. And they do tremendously important things for us. So they help us metabolize vitamins. They help us metabolize drugs. They produce vitamins that the body cannot normally produce. And in that sense, they act as symbionts. They help us do things that we cannot do for ourselves. Uh, and as it turns out, they also affect the body's response to immune therapy. So what the, the key things that we try to ask and answer this very, very simply was, how, when, and why does it affect response to immune therapy? And can we measure that? Can it also affect responses to side effects? And can you do something to try to make it better in people who don't appear to have a good microbiome to begin with. So how do we know that, that uh, the gut microbiome is important? The short answer is antibiotics are bad. So preclinically, uh, meaning if you give a mouse an antibiotic and you study the response of immune therapy in the anti uh, to that antibiotic treated mouse, these mice do worse. Now, as it turns out across cancer patients, the effect size of antibiotics is tremendous. So what people have seen is that uh, if you look at antibiotic treated patients compared to antibiotic non-treated patients, the hazard ratio of doing poorly is 4.4. What that means is that if you take antibiotics and the definition of antibiotics and across these studies is typically something that is oral or intravenous and something that is absorbed. Something that's not absorbed is generally not counted. Something that is topical is generally not counted. And as it turns out, there are also a lot more antibiotics in America than they are in Europe for reasons that we don't quite understand, probably to do with prescription preferences. But the effect size is about four times. What that means is if you get <coughs> antibiotics, you tend to do worse by a factor of four. Now, for people who don't, can't contextualize that, checkpoint and inhibitor immunotherapy, when you add a CTLA-4 inhibitor, it adds about 15%. If you add an antibiotic, it not only removes the CTLA-4 inhibitor, it detracts from that by half. So when you think of the effect size of uh, antibiotics. Antibiotics really tremendously diminish the, uh, the effect of checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. And this has now been shown, you know, uh, pretty tremendously across multiple cancers, but melanoma included. Now, uh, what else uh, do we think, uh, how else do we get the idea that the gut microbiome might play a role? 
So the other kind of indirect proof of evidence is that the stuff that nourishes the bacteria appears to help us as well. So what, what do these bacteria live on? And as it turns out, like symbionts, the pets in your house and the uh, very similar to the to, to, to work in animals. Uh, these bugs are also, in, uh, the, the stuff that you eat also helps these bugs. The primary thing that bugs need is actually fiber. Now, as it turns out, eating a large amount of fiber has been shown to be good for you. So the, the, the definition of high fiber for most people in most of these studies was about 20 grams. So let me contextualize what 20 grams is. So you saw out there, there was a little platter. And as, as typical in most of these platters, the fruit is the platter that is still quite full. And then all the stuff with sugar on the top is largely gone. And the stuff that really helps you is not the stuff with sugar on the top, it's actually the fruit. If you'd eaten a pint of blueberries, that's five grams of fiber. So in order to have a fairly decent response to checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy, you need to eat about 20 grams of fiber. Now, 20 grams of fiber is quite a lot. You can get that where four pints of blueberries. You can try consuming an uh, entire cantaloupe, or you could try taking a set of pills. And uh, as a result, if you take the pills, which is probably the easiest way to uh, get up 20 grams of fiber in you, um, the primary problem is that, you know, the person sitting next to you will probably want to sit a little further because the biggest side effect of these pills is gas and flatulence. So the point is that as it turns out, fiber is actually pretty good for you because it improves the likelihood of uh, checkpoint number therapy response. And in addition to fiber, the other thing that the bugs get nourished from are actually certain fermented foods. So when people have looked at fermented foods, so that this data mostly comes from uh, Sonnenberg, Justin Sonnenberg at, uh, at Stanford. Uh, they found that both fiber and fermented foods had differential non-overlapping effects on the gut microbiome. And specifically, uh, fiber causes a, you know, a shift in the functional uh, nature of the bugs that you have. And fermented foods have completely different dramatic shifts as well. And the fermented food group category by itself is actually associated with reduced markers of inflammation. Now, the fermented foods that people generally think about in this getting are things like that are not particularly common in the American diet, but not necessarily unheard of in the Western diet. So sauerkraut, pretty good. Kimchi, pretty good. Uh, and uh, things like things that contain vinegar, you know, that's how you generally preserve something. Um, and then the final proof that these gut bacteria probably appear to be important. So beyond the fact that antibiotics are bad, right? And antibiotics kill bugs. Fiber that nourishes bugs or fermented food that nourishes bugs are good. Uh, we actually looked at the composition of gut bacteria. So we did this by literally going and collecting poop samples. And uh, this is primarily what I did for about four years when I started on faculty here. So I was calling up people and saying, please return your poop sample. Um, and what we showed was that basically people who did well and people who didn't do well, so responders and non-responders to checkpoint inhibitor, checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy had very distinct gut microbiota. So what you can do is very simply, if you, if you want to separate two groups of people, you can define two groups of people differently and you can look at them on a, you can look at them using essentially what is a Tisney plot. And as it turns out, when we did that and we separated people who did well and didn't do well, they had very, very distinct gut microbiota. These gut microbiota appear to play an important role that is time dependent. So again, what that tells us is that when you look at whom and when these gut microbiota appear to play an impact on, it's very early in the response to checkpoint and libido immunotherapy. So anybody who's gotten a checkpoint knows that uh, you, get a, you get the drug, you see Melissa, you get the drug, uh, they do their first CAT scan at three months. Sometimes a CAT scan is good. Sometimes it's not good. Then they do another CAT scan at six months to tell you that it's still good, or if it's not good to confirm that it isn't good. And if you don't do well during that period, you come off and they find you a different trial. Now, as it turns out, that category, meaning the people who do not have a response in the first instance, which happens you know, between three to nine months, is when it appears to be the period of time that the gut microbiome appears to exert the greatest effect. What that means to say is that the gut microbiome appears to play a fundamental role in impacting early response or the likelihood of response to begin with. And as it turns out, this is a key biomarker that you know, uh, doesn't really normally get routinely measured. And then of course you can look at the different bugs and find out which is good and which is bad. And we've already done that. Uh, but the, the other question is, if you're trying to show this to a scientific audience, the key question that some of you might ask is why, right? I mean, sure, you have a whole bunch of bugs. How many bugs do you have? You have about something like 100 trillion bugs. So it's hard to conceptualize what 100 trillion is. But 
in many ways to do that. One, it's more money than you have and I have and anybody in the room has. It's also more money than Jeff Bezos has. It's more money than anybody in the United States has, and it's four times the national debt. So basically, 100 trillion is a lot. And as it turns out, these 100 trillion bugs, if you don't have good bugs, what happens is that you have more myeloid cells. So basically, when you have bad bugs, what happens is these adverse microorganisms start producing certain substances. And these substances promote essentially what is known as what a, a produce a certain protein known as IL-8. And IL-8 is kind of generally just a bad chemical. When you have bad IL-8, high levels of IL-8, uh, this is data from eventually the Genentech group on the left and the BMS group on the right, but basically across four different cancers. So non-small cell lung cancer, squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, adeno, kidney cancer, and melanoma, high levels of IL-8 in red are associated with poor outcomes, low levels of IL-8 associated with good outcomes. And the same is true from the genetic study using urothelial cancer. The short answer is that IL-8 is bad. And what we showed was that the reason why you have high IL-8 is because of bad bugs. So basically these adverse microorganisms essentially promote a phenotype that is associated with a bad intratumoral myeloid program sustained by high levels of plasma IL-8 and in, do, so, in, in so doing, they prevent the immune therapy from working. Now, when you think about this, it sounds hard to relate, but it's actually no different than when you send your kids to school. So when you send your kids to school, you know, it turns out it's a fairly big school, public school, and it's all about the influence on the child and how the child does long-term is all relatively contextualized. The child has more good friends than bad, turns out the child may do better. If the child has more bad friends than good, then you have to worry about influences. And the gut microbiome operates in a very, very similar fashion. It exerts a influence. It doesn't solely determine, but it exerts a strong influence one way or the other. More favorable bugs than unfavorable, you tend to do well. More unfavorable than favorable, you tend to do poorly. And as it turns out, the problem with unfavorable is you don't get to pick what you have. Kind of like going to public school. You don't get to pick the composition of the school, one. Two, you can also, as it turns out, selectively add to bad bugs. And as it turns out, bad bugs are a little bit more resilient than good bugs. And so antibiotics, part of the reason why we think that they're bad is because the effect of the antibiotic is asymmetrical. Antibiotics kill more good bugs than bad. So the use of antibiotics appears to uh, cause checkpoint and a bit of non-response primarily by exerting an effect of killing, uh, adversely killing mostly the good organisms. And you can, uh, we've shown the mechanism by which this operates. So beyond response, what else can it do? As it turns out, you can also predict who's gonna get side effects and what kind of side effects they're gonna get. So when we looked at this, we essentially did the same thing. You look at a two group of people with side effects, you find out who has side effects, who doesn't have side effects, and you look at them and those two, two groups segregate. You can basically predict which kind of side effect the person is gonna get by looking at their gut microbiome. So if you have, for example, um, um, thyroid problems or joint problems, you tend to have these bugs, it, particularly streptococcus. It's a very interesting organism. It's actually associated a lot with joint problems and also uh, very interestingly with liver problems. And um, you can, there are certain other organisms such as blautia that are associated in particular with uh, things like uh, vitiligo and uh, certain gram negatives that are associated with colitis. The reason why this is important is because uh, for two reasons, one, Historically speaking, there was this whole idea as to whether or not uh, side effects were good or the side effects were bad. There was a lot of data that suggested that side effects in general were good. And then there was this large study from Merck that suggested that side effects were bad. But what we, what we were able to do was we were able to reconcile the two observations. And we think that the difference in observations is to do with the nature of the side effect. So for example, when you look at side effects across the board, generally the development of side effects is a good thing. Uh, meaning it's more likely to be associated with a favorable response, but there are some side effects, particularly speaking, the side effects that are associated with streptococcus that are bad. And the reason that's kind of interesting is because streptococcus is not generally speaking gut commensal. So that's basically fancy speak for saying that it's not supposed to be there. The only way it gets there is if you take another medicine because streptococcus is found in your mouth, not in your colon. And the only way it can get to your colon is if you take a proton pump inhibitor, which brings me to the second category of medicines that you should try to avoid. And that is anything that affects your gut pH adversely, which means um, PPIs, uh, proton pump inhibitors, pepsid, famotidine, all of these things actually are there to reduce the amount of acid, so they, they, they block acid secretion, and so they elevate gut pH 
America is the only country where we actually, you can buy this over the counter, right? There's that fat guy on the lawnmower going around, zipping around, telling you that you need to buy omeprazole or esomeprazole. And the only reason you have that is because we have tried to normalize obesity uh, and barbecue, which both of which are probably not a good thing. But the point is that, that omeprazole and, and famotidine and all these other medicines that affect acid actually doing something completely unnatural. In women, they increase the risk of osteoporosis. In, uh, across the board, they increase the risk of causing shifts in your gut microbiome. And as it turns out, they help you enable streptococcus to go into your colon. Streptococcus is not supposed to be in your colon. When it goes there, it crosses the, the gastric barrier, the intestinal barrier, and it starts causing all kinds of adverse, adverse effects. So we've been able to show that the historical reasons why there were uh, differences in you know, who had good side effects and bad side effects, what were thought good or bad side effects is largely due to the asymmetrical distribution of streptococcus amongst different species. So finally, what can you do to change this? Well, as it turns out, you can do a heck of a lot. So there are a whole bunch of people doing things like high fiber interventions, really very, very neat things. You know, At MD Anderson, they're running a trial where literally they are cooking your food for you. Now, I don't know if I'd feel comfortable with food that you get from a hospital kitchen, but somehow in Texas, they managed to convince people to eat that stuff. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a finite intervention. So you don't basically eat their stuff for a year. I also imagine that they don't do, do this. They don't do this around Thanksgiving or other holidays. They do this uh, as a defined intervention for about you know, a couple of weeks and then they measure the effect. And they're doing this basically in high risk melanoma that has been treated adjuvantly as well as advanced metastatic melanoma. The, the results are not available yet. There are other ways in which you can do this. You can also literally try to change the gut microbiome, uh, my, uh, gut microbiome using single bacteria, what are known as monoclonal candidates, consortia, defined consortia, such as the consortia from Ceres or the consortia from Vedanta, that's the stuff in the middle. And also, if you decide you don't know which organism to pick and you don't really want to rely on one organism or a cluster of organisms and you don't really feel like eating the food from MD Anderson, what you could do is you could just change the gut microbiome wholesale. And so we did that um, and two groups, actually three groups have reported on that. So this is the uh, data from the MIMIC trial, which is basically from uh, Canada. And so this trial in Canada, quite uh, very interesting. Basically they took patients with advanced uh, melanoma. So this is uh, patients with metastatic disease and they gave them immune therapy. So single agent immune therapy, you normally expect a response rate of about 35%. And in addition to that, just before they got immune therapy, they gave them a fecal transplant that came from a healthy donor. So generally speaking, the healthy donors in all of these trials are young college kids because of the, you know, those are the only people signing up to donate stool samples for 50 bucks a pop. And, um, the, 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 the fecal matter is administered in the form of a pill. And those pills are uh, given for about seven days uh, prior to uh, the, the, the administration of the uh, immune therapy agent, which in this case was uh, either pembrolizumab or nivolumab. The response rate is quite exciting, about 65%, so double what you'd expect. And they found some very interesting changes, basically what is known as uh, they observe engraftment. So engraftment basically means what is the likelihood of seeing that the bugs take? And you can measure take as essentially proximity. And what you observe is that the proximity is basically favorable for the responders and unfavorable for the non-responders. We did, a, we did a, a trial in a different setting. Two trials were done, a trial here and a trial in Israel. And basically we, what we did was we gave people a single fecal transplant. And in our case, the fecal transplant came from people who were not willing to sign up for 50 bucks a pop. These were actually patients with advanced cancer who had cancer that was cured as a result of checkpoint inhibitor immune therapy. So basically we have a very large melanoma program. We have about 50 people a year who have who go into remission and you basically track these people down and ask them, are they willing to be stool donors? If you are in that unfortunate group that says, yes, I keep bugging you, have you give us a stool sample, get the stool samples in, we test the stool for a whole array of microorganisms, including COVID, and we make sure that you don't have any bugs. And then we administer that stool uh, to um, patients who might need it because they don't have any response to checkpoint in the immunotherapy. And so when we did this, we found quite excitingly that a small proportion of people had rather unusual responses. Uh, nine people, unfortunately, did not, but six people had cancer that either shrank or stopped growing. And that shrinkage or uh, cessation in growth was associated with immune activation 
uh, as well as, uh, interestingly enough, like I talked about earlier, a reduction in myeloid cells. And so we think we now know why this is happening. We, we think it's happening because basically the good organisms are now allowed to outcompete the bad. And all that you're doing when you give somebody a fecal transplant is you're pressing reset on the computer that has started to show you the blue screen. And um, what we're trying to do is do more experiments going forward. So very, very simply to summarize, what we think that is happening is checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy is curative. Uh, we know it's curative because from the work from many people in the room, uh, including Dr. Kirkwood, this fundamental drug, which is pembrolizumab or nivolumab, cures people. When you get this drug, it's a single agent, 24, uh, about 27% of the time is a single agent, your cancer is cured at the four-year mark. With combination immunotherapy from Bristol-Myers, that number is as high as 39%. And so these drugs are curative. The problem is, even if it's 39%, 61% of the time, these drugs don't work. And as it turns out, the primary time they don't work is in the first 10 months. And in that fraction of patients, the 30 to 50% of people who have cancer that does not respond in the first year of therapy, the gut microbiome probably plays a fairly important role. And trying to fix it might be a good idea. How can you study this? Well, we are now trying to prove this in other cancers. So we have now collected, in addition to uh, the melanoma samples, we have something like 900 stool samples from 400 patients with kidney cancer, bladder cancer, melanoma, lung cancer, and all kinds of cancers treated with immune therapy. And we're looking at the same thing to try to see if this is true in more than just melanoma. The second thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to fix it. So beyond just fixing this now in, in the proof of concept experiment, we have another trial, and this trial is quite exciting. Uh, the first trial, two trials, one here, one in Israel. The trial on the right is from Pittsburgh. The trial on the left is from Israel. We used eight donors. They used two. Uh, and we are uh, pretty certain that the fecal uh, transplant experiments work a lot better than looking at consortia because the consortia do not appear to be very effective. So the next set of questions is, can you prove this in, in melanoma and can you prove this in other cancers? So where we are very interested in this in melanoma is that... Uh, Merck has a combination known as pembrolizumab with lenvatinib. This is a combination that is not yet FDA approved, but is in the advanced stages of testing. In highly refractory melanoma, it produces responses in about 20 to 25% of patients. The major side effect of lenvatinib though is diarrhea. So if you start taking lenvatinib, most patients end up with a diarrhea that is pretty significant. Uh, about 50% of the time, lenvatinib needs to be cut down about 60% of the time. And as it turns out, fecal transplants are actually quite in interestingly enough efficacious in treating lenvatinib-related side effects. So the question that we developed was if you know that lenvatinib is, is going to cause side effects and pembrolizumab and lenvatinib is pretty efficacious in treating melanoma, can you add a fecal transplant to it to try to make it work even better and also eliminate side effects? So generation two of testing, make the drug better and reduce side effects. So the experiment is a fairly simple one. Basically patients with advanced melanoma get pembrolizumab and lenvatinib, half get pembrolizumab and lenvatinib, which is already very efficacious. The other half get the same combination with the addition of a responder derived fecal transplant. And we're giving this transplant in the form of a pill so that patients don't have to undergo colonoscopies outside of the first two. So they get a two colonoscopic administrations of the fecal transplant. After that, they get pills. And uh, we then look to see you know, whether it's working. This has now been funded and we are waiting to open the study. Beyond this, we're also looking to see if it's gonna be efficacious in lung cancer. So this is a study that we've already gotten some funding for. There's, you know, again, like I showed you, some good evidence to see whether or not it's, it's, it's promising in uh, melanoma and we're now doing a proof of concept experiment in lung cancer. I'm working with one of my colleagues here in the lung cancer field on this and very similar to melanoma. It's basically checkpoint inhibitor resistant patients with lung cancer who are getting uh, a fecal transplant and we're trying to see whether or not it's gonna work. And finally, um, other, please, uh, other people are also doing the same thing. So uh, there's an entire group in, in uh, Canada that is very interested in studying this. And so in Canada, they are running a very similar trial, but in PD-1 naive, melanoma, lung cancer, and choroidal melanoma, and they've got some very exciting results as well. So finally, um, side effects. So we're very interested in proving that we've already shown that the gut microbiome plays an important role in mediating the development of side effects. What we're very interested in studying is whether you can fix it to treat side effects. And why might this be the case? Well, as it turns out, the vast majority of side effects that patients 
with immune therapy experience as side effects at the barrier organs. So the barrier organs are your skin, the colon, the lung, and these are places where, the, where existing microorganisms are already meeting the immune system. So your skin, for example, harbors a whole host of microorganisms. So does your gut and so do your lungs. And as it turns out, we think that the primary development of side effects happens in patients who have what are termed pathobions. So these are the not so good bugs that some people have for no reason other than the fact that they have them. And so what we're looking at is whether or not a fecal transplant can eliminate those bad bugs such as streptococcus or the other organisms. And so this has already been shown to be quite effective in a small proof of concept experiment done at MD Anderson. Uh, so the remission rate is something like 64% in patients who are very, very refractory. So as you know, the primary treatment for side effects is steroids, which is counterintuitive because immune therapy is supposed to affect the immune system. And here we are giving people with immune therapy side effects steroids to counteract the fact of immune therapy. And then if that doesn't work, we give you infliximab, which is a TNF alpha inhibitor, which is even more immune suppressive. What we're trying to do is just basically press reset on that and just give people a fecal transplant instead of steroids. And so this is a large experiment that is ongoing right now uh, through a larger mechanism. And we are very excited about this primarily because we think that there's going to be a, a whole host of side effects that happens in the next 10 years for two reasons. One, uh, checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy, as you've heard from Dr. Kirkwood and, and, and others, is migrating early into the life cycle of the patient. So metastatic disease was you know, about 20% of the patient population. Stage 3 disease was about 25% of the patient population. Stage 2 disease, another 20% of the patient population now has access to checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. So checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy is basically now accessible to more than 50% of melanoma. In addition to that, it's accessible to 17 different indications in cancer. So not just melanoma, melanoma, lung cancer, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, a whole host of cancers, including two disease agnostic indications. So we expect the burden of side effects to explode in the next five to 10 years. And that's part of the reason why we, one thing that we want to do is we want to study side effects. The second reason is CTLA-4 inhibitors, which were developed initially by Bristol-Myers, uh, actually uh, newer agents have been developed and they're extraordinarily effective. So the first is a drug known as botencilumab or Gen 1181 from a genus. This drug is producing responses in colorectal cancer that is microsatellite stable. Immune therapy has historically never worked in colorectal cancer. This drug is causing radi radiographic responses in 25% of colorectal cancer patients. Except that the way the drug works, it's, it's designed to work by augmenting antigen presenting cells. Turns out when you do that, you get more side effects. So 24% of colorectal cancer patients benefit, 40% have severe diarrhea. This drug is now migrating into melanoma. At some point in time, patients with melanoma are gonna be getting this drug and we potentially worry about the effect of side effects. So what we are looking at, uh, trials to try to en uh, enable these patients to get um, access to some kind of gut mi microbiome modifying strategy. Uh, to treat these refractory side effects because we expect that these side effects are going to be fairly hard to treat. So those are my funding um, sources and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any, but we're very excited about this space and we thank everybody um, who, you know, here in the room because most of you have had a call from me asking me uh, to return your stool specimen and now you know why. Thanks, Dilkar. Um, we have a couple of questions already, and I'll give them both together to you. Uh, any data regarding gut microbiome significance in acral and mucosal melanomas, which are a major issue that afflicts not the Caucasian population, but uh, the Asian and African American populations. And with that, how long until fecal treatment becomes a standard of care? Well, um, so, it's maybe easier to answer the first question. So the first question was acral and mucosal melanomas. Um, the short answer is we don't know because at this point in time, um, one checkpoint inhibitor therapy doesn't work quite as well in these patient populations as cutaneous melanoma. And so we just don't have a lot of information from them. Where I can, what I can tell you is the areas of research that have gone into trying to find out why and how this might play a role. So specifically in the context of acral and mucosal melanoma, there's a very big group <clears throat> at the University of Colorado with a, that specifically has studied, uh, is studying uh, rare melanomas, including acral and mucosal. 
And what they have done is they've specifically looked at the role of the intratumoral microbiome, so the bacteria that is within the tumor, to try to see how the bacteria within the tumor actually prevent immune therapy from working and whether this might have a bigger role in tumors that do not respond as well uh, as the other tumors to checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. That's specifically of interest in acral and mucosal because the response rates there are about half of what you'd expect with skin melanoma. So acral and mucosal, the biggest uh, areas of interest are looking at the intratumoral microbiome to see if that is an area that can be modulated. Uh, second question, which was, when is this going to become FDA approved? Now, this is a very controversial question. As it turns out, fecal transplants cost next to nothing. So um, the right now, there's a key question of how you even go about doing this. Because the first thing is, what we don't want to do is tell people, and this is really not, this is literally not something to be tried at home, right? Like, you don't want to be going on Amazon, pressing, typing in fecal transplant, because if you type in, you will find something, right? It basically looks like an inverted Coke bottle. You do not want to be buying that kit and trying to do this at home, right? I mean, for obvious reasons. And so you have to have a product that is characterized. In, for example, when you have a product that is non-characterized, you can have serious issues, infections, bowel perforations. There are companies that are in the space. So for example, uh, the initial wave of enthusiasm in the microbiome space um, led to the development of certain entities. So for example, there are companies not right now in Europe. One company is known as Matt Pharma. Uh, they have already announced that they have a product that is in the very advanced stages of testing to treat uh, graft versus host disease. And they are also looking at a trial known as the Picasso trial uh, in advanced cutaneous melanoma using a gut microbiome intervention. So it's immune therapy plus minus a microbiome intervention in French patients who have um, advanced melanoma. There's also a, a European company, a Scottish company known as Entrobiotics that has a similar uh, large um, donor-derived fecal suspension that is being used in the space. The reason we expect this to happen is for the very first time in recorded history, uh, we have a new product in the space. So Rebiotics, which was a microbiome company, has just got a drug approved in the fecal, uh, a fecal transplant product. Basically, this is a suspension enema to treat refractory C. diff. So the very first time a microbiome drug has been approved to treat anything. So we expect that this approval, along with the interest of other people in the space and the data that has been generated, will lead to at least a uh, development of clinical trials uh, looking at this area. When that is going to result in a drug approval, I think it's going to take a while. Thank you so much, Dubakar. So to close our morning uh, of discussions, um, an area that we've really uh, been very fortunate to have an expert uh, join us um, in is that of pediatric and adolescent melanomas. And as you all know, the incidence of melanoma peaks in the late 50s in general, but we see a substantial number of them under 20. And it's in those cases that things may be different. And that Dr. Sanavo will talk about this uh, from the pediatric oncologist special. Uh, Perspective. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for having me here today. I, I somehow always follow Dr. Devar talking about his um, his fecal work, so we're going to change gears a little bit. <laughs> um, okay, so um, today we I hope to uh, review a little bit about just the incidence. What is the problem that we're dealing with when we take care of young patients? Um, with melanoma, understand the challenges we face in the field of pediatric melanoma, understand where we're going, and then um, lastly, for you to be aware of our program and what we can offer to patients and families. So pediatric and adolescent um, young adult melanoma, I always start with this slide to put, put it into perspective that you know, for new cases of melanoma in 2023, there's estimated about 97,000 cases. When we look at the young we, we break this down by age groups in the zero to 20 population, the patients that I'm seeing, um, this makes up only less than 1% of those overall cases. Uh, so 0.4% of cases or 420 cases. Of course, when we get into the um, young adult population, 20 to 34 years of age, it becomes more prevalent at about 5% of the overall cases. Um, but when we put this into perspective in the world of cancer, 
in my world of pediatric oncology for all types of cancer we take care of in children in the United States, we'll see only about 10,000 cases of new cancer um, in zero to 14 years of age. So in the, it, when you think of it in the setting of, um, of melanoma at large, it doesn't make up a lot, but it is a significant problem when we look at um, when we're thinking about pediatric cancer and what we see walk in our doors. Um, so I always say it's really, it really does seem like a drop in the bucket um, in, the, in the melanoma world. Um, and I think as I'm here to uh, talk about today, we'll see that in some ways we've been left behind and we're trying to, uh, trying to catch up. Um, but I will mention, this is the most common skin cancer in children. So if um, I, it is rare that we see other types of skin cancer in children, usually they have other comorbidities or they've had other types of cancer, um, but this is, a, this is a real problem for us and, um, and, and we wish that we are not forgotten. Um, so we, it's the most common cancer. It's not that uncommon when we think about pediatric cancer overall, yet making the diagnosis and the treatment plan remains a major challenge. So when I hear these talks, I always, um, or follow uh, DeWalker, I always think, you know, we are so fortunate um, for all of the advances that have been made in melanoma to, to ride on those coattails. But when I'm seeing patients in the clinic, we are so far behind. The problems are, are up front. So there's a real lack of clinical suspicion. Kids go into their pediatrician's office, into a dermatology office, um, you name it, um, any provider, and no one has on their mind that this might be melanoma that they're dealing with. Um, most people don't think children can get melanoma. Um, how do we predict the outcomes? We finally get someone to um, do, a do a biopsy on a child with a suspicious skin lesion, and then they're sitting in front of me and, and it's really hard to be able to tell the family your child's going to be just fine um, or your child may die of this disease and we need to act now. Um, we have a lack of prospective data. So what does that mean? We, um, we see the child in front of us. We wonder um, if we can compare them to some other patient that might've had a very similar presentation and diagnosis but we don't have the, the large robust data that we have in the adult uh, melanoma world um, to be able to predict exactly how that child is going to do. And lastly, we have a lack of consensus of treatment. So um, I certainly, um, when I meet patients and families, I, I, I will say I'm conservative. I work with um, a great group of melanoma doctors, and I know that this is a serious disease and we take care of those children who do have um, bad outcomes. And so um, it's hard to downgrade recommendations for treatment for a family that's sitting in front of you if I can't tell them with certainty that their child is going to be fine. Um, and so I leave you with this slide because it, this, these are the, um, the problems as I see it. And these are really the, pro the, the um, parts of the pediatric melanoma sphere that I work on regularly. Um, and so it really is the, a rare disease and we have all the challenges of it. So we know we're, we know we're behind, um, but then also we have a delay in diagnosis, no one's suspecting it. Um, we'll get to a little bit in subsequent slides that there's a very atypical presentation. And then even when we do get a biopsy, um, trying to decide if we're dealing with an atypical nevus um, or cutaneous melanoma is extremely challenging. And I think um, from um, the talk um, that we had two talks ago, it, uh, we, I live in the zone of um, intermediate grade. Uh, we get a biopsy. I could give it to um, five different pathologists and I'll get five different answers. This is melanoma. This isn't melanoma. You're over-treating the child. Um, this is somewhere in the middle. We can't predict it. We'll only know um, in, in 15 years when you tell us how the child did. So are we behind? Yes, we are. We're catching up. Um, you know, this we the it's apples and oranges, so we can't always compare, but they're both fruit. Um, and so there's similarities and there's differences. And um, you know, what I really try to advocate for is that we figure out how pediatric mel melanoma can fit into this puzzle um, in the world of melanoma at large. So it, uh, thinking a little bit more about this clinical suspicion problem and um, why, um, why it's not detected early on. So here um, we have reviewed these slides before in other talks, the classic signs and symptoms of, of uh, melanoma clinically. Um, 
asymmetric, borders uneven, color variation, diameter, um, over six millimeters in anything evolving or the ugly duckling mole. Um, however, in the pediatric world, we do not see the same ABCDEs. So here's a study from several years ago now, just looking at a large cohort of patients um, with pediatric melanoma. Um, and those, um, those investigators found that most most children, um, so over half of children in the zero to 10 age population will not present um, conforming to those traditional ABCDE detection criteria. When we get into the older adolescent population, um, they more often have lesions that, that look more like adult melanoma, but, um, but still a really significant proportion don't, don't present. So you, have, you can't blame a provider. They have a patient in the office um, they have a lesion that looks like this. Um, it's amelanotic. Um, it's a smooth bump. It's uniform in color. Um, and it can be any size, but usually the, what the family will, will mention is that it developed out of nowhere. So instead of a mole that the patient already had and evolved and changed, um, it really usually is that it just came out of nowhere. They think it's something else. They think it's something benign. Um, and so here are these modified ABCD detection criteria for children. Um, that, that those authors had developed. And I would tell you that this is, um, this is the majority of patients in the office that I see. Um, and I, if I could record the patients, which, which we do in some of our, in some of our studies, but, um, and play it back, it's, it's every time heart wrenching, um, when the family tells you their story of thinking that that lesion was a wart and it was frozen and it was, um, they were doing wart treatment at home and then, well, they thought maybe it was a cyst and they stuck a needle in it and they tried to drain pus from it, but there was no pus. And then finally they just had had it um, and they asked someone to take it off and then they get this diagnosis back that is um, life-changing and shocking. So, um, so here it is, our typical and atypical lesion classification. Um, we have a study ongoing that's, um, that I won't share all, the, all of the results um, in this talk for this, for these purposes, but we have classified our patients that we have walk in through our pediatric melanoma pro program as being either a typical appearance, um, these brown black meeting the traditional ABCDE detection criteria, or atypical appearing, again, our smooth red bumps. Um, and, and it certainly plays out that most of our patients have atypical appearing lesions. Um, those patients have a much longer time to diagnosis, which we know early detection means everything in melanoma. Um, um, but we also know that the, this, the appearance of the lesion does not predict the outcome. So we have many, many children who um, end up going on to have metastatic disease or even, even die of their disease, and they present with these atypical appearing lesions. Um, okay, so changing gears a little bit, we've, we've, I've, um, I beg and borrow and plead to all of our pediatricians in the community and our doctors about please, 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 if you see a red bump in a child, don't assume that it's benign. Um, and so now I've convinced them to do a biopsy, they do a biopsy and they're in front of us and how do we know, how do we predict the outcome? Well, first we have to start with terminology and classification, which is where this gets really murky. Um, in the pediatric world, um, yes, we can say melanoma, but usually we'll break it down into, is it conventional type melanoma or more adult type melanoma? Is it Spitz melanoma, um, which I'll talk about more on the next slide, or is this a melanoma arising within a large congenital nevus, um, which, is, um, which is a different entity? So what is a Spitz melanoma? Dr. Sophie Spitz in 1948 um, was, see, was a pathologist. She was seeing biopsies of skin lesions in children that under the microscope for all intents and purposes appeared to be melanoma, but children were doing better, but sometimes they weren't, um, which is what, what we're still living now today. Um, and so there's a certain characteristic of, um, of the melanoma cells under the microscope. Um, if they're epithelial, epithelioid appearing, um, they fall into the Spitz category. Um, and there are benign Spitz nevi, of which, of course, I don't usually take care of those children. Um, there are straightforward Spitz melanoma, but boy, it's really hard to get a pathologist to commit to that diagnosis. Um, and then in between, there are atypical Spitzoid tumors. Um, the problem is that despite what you call it, um, whether or not it's, it's truly atypical and is not going to be a problem if we just excise it and let them go on to be a normal child versus is this malignant and we need to give this kid systemic therapy, um, it's really a challenge um, and we struggle with it uh, greatly. 
so is it cancer or is this not cancer? That's what every single family asks me. Um, Lauren Kirk, who has been greeting you today, calls these families to schedule schedule with me. And there's a range of uh, a range of reactions. Either it's why would I come see an oncologist? I was told this wasn't cancer, that I was fine, um, or um, you know the the opposite reaction of being extremely terrified. So you know it lies in this: the pathology is confusing. Um, benign versus malignant is really difficult to distinguish. We're working on that. And then many genetic tests on the tumor are performed, but not one test is prognostic. And I think, you know, we, we reviewed the um, gene, gene DX uh, results that are often used in adults predicting, is this malignant or is this not? These, these, these melanomas in children are different. They have different genomic drivers. Um, and, and it's really unfortunate that sometimes that information gets extrapolated to this pop population and probably um, um, incorrectly so. So I've had patients who come in and they have metastatic melanoma, but their, their gene DX was a 1A and it was predicted that they were going to do just fine. And, and the family is reassured by that. But again, um, there really has been no studies, including children in these type of lesions to know um, really what we're, what we're dealing with. So, um, so one of our projects that we have go ongoing is um, we have a lot of interest in telomere biology. So I think we heard in the um, in the PLA talk where they're doing the sticky on top of the the lesion and peeling it off. That one of the one of the tests that's included there is TERT promoter mutation. We think it's very important in pediatrics too. Um, it, it can predict a poor outcome, but it, we know it's not the only thing that can predict a poor outcome because I've certainly had children that don't do well that, that, that did not have a TERP promoter mutation. So um, I'm, we're working with um, researchers that study telomeres um, in general, and we're looking for other mutations um, within, um, within the telomere biology world that might work together with a TERP promoter mutation um, to be able to predict outcomes. So we're hoping um, if we study a lot of patients who, um, who have so graciously donated their, their tissues to our tissue bank, um, and we look back, we know whether or not they've done well or if they've done poorly, um, that we can delineate some of these similarities and differences between our different melanoma variants. And in my world, it's, it's the kids versus the older adult melanoma. So more of that to come um, in the next couple of years. And then lack, um, moving on a little bit to talk about the lack of prospective data and our uh, lack of the consensus on treatment. So, so here's our quest. Um, I, I don't know which is more difficult to determine how a kid's gonna do or um, to determine once we determine that they do have melanoma and we need to treat them, determining what that treatment is. So um, we've already reviewed the upfront classification is extremely challenging. And then, and then when you're making treatment recommendations, there's genuine uncertainty. So as many of you know, these surgeries are not, um, they're not little, they can be, um, they can be life altering and, and disfiguring, um, resecting a primary melanoma. And in children, when they're, they're smaller and they have growth, um, they still have a lot of growth to do, it can be a big problem. So a, a big scar on a little human um, who still needs to grow into that scar and grow into their body and have um, functional abilities uh, later in life is, is a big deal. And so there's a few school of thoughts where um, kids do fine with melanoma, barely do, do a very, very small re-excision, um, don't worry about doing these big surgeries. Um, but then there's us probably and myself um, that, well, until we truly have the prospective data to say a child is going to do just fine um, with, with more minor surgeries, then we ought to give them um, the, same, um, the same treatment that an adult would walk in um, the door with. Likewise, lots of debate on who to perform sentinel lymph node biopsies on. So some of these Spitz tumors um, we know can have... Um, can have positive lymph nodes up front, but it doesn't necessarily predict in the same way that a positive lymph node in, in traditional melanoma does. Um, and then again, what is the systemic treatment? So I, I leave you with this example. That's, um, that's an example from um, an expert, um, expert consensus of excisional margins are tailored to individual cases based on size and depth. So that's you know how, how deep the tumor is, our Breslow depth, Sentinel lymph node not recommended unless malignant Spitz tumor cannot be rolled out. And that's just funny um, because we don't still know how to roll that in or out.
So what are we doing about this? Um, the Children's Oncology Group is our consortium of pediatric oncologists, um, our treatment consortium that at any large pediatric or really any pediatric oncology center, we work together for treatment of all of our cancers um, to pool our numbers and our data and make sure that we're making advances um, in the treatment of, of all children with cancer. Um, until more recently, melanoma trials have been extremely limited through the COG. So um, there has never been a COG-led melanoma initiative. We've been able to um, jump on the backs of our adult colleagues in, the, in ECOG um, and have and allow enrollment of children, but even that, the enrollment has been poor. And so the spotlight really hasn't been in the pediatric oncology community on melanoma. And um, I'm determined to change that. So um, after much... Um, much begging, borrowing, and pleading, um, the COG has agreed to allow me to lead a new multi multidisciplinary melanoma task force. Um, we're working hard with, with providers all across the, the country who take care of these children. So myself as an oncologist, um, our adult oncologist, Dr. Kirkwood participates in this, um, and then many of our surgeons and dermatologists to, um, to develop a clinical trial that would that would um, follow all of these children prospectively, um, um, classify them up front, the genetics of their tumor, be able to follow, follow them in a very, very um, rigorous fashion to see how they do and be able to extrapolate those, um, those results to, to future children. So are we on the right path? Well, I think so, I hope so. Um, we're increasing awareness. I talk to anyone that um, is willing to listen about melanoma. Um, and I'm really always so happy to be included in these, in these um, events. Um, we're working hard to make sure that we're including patients um, with pediatric melanoma in clinical trials and research. Our, our, um, our melanoma team knows that, um, that anything new is coming down the pike. Please include me. Please email me. I will work hard to make sure that kids get that, that opportunity that our older patients are are, are getting. And then of course, advocacy and support from the community is, is really everything. Um, and so that I'll leave you with information for our program. Um, here it is. You can type in pediatric melanoma, UPMC. You can find our information and how to contact us. Lauren um, Kirk takes phone calls from scared patients, um, parents, and providers all of the time. Um, and if you're not sure, you just call us. Um, here's what we do. We know if a patient gets a biopsy, they're a kid, they have a melanocytic tumor. We don't even care if it's benign. If you're just not sure um, what that pathology report means or if the child needs more, more, more therapy, this is usually done in, in surgeon's office, dermatology office, and PCP office. Just call us, refer to the program. We'll make sure the child gets a comprehensive evaluation and provide management recommendations. It absolutely makes my day to see a new patient where I get to say, oh, this is, I wouldn't worry about this. Um, please go be a kid, come back and see me in a year. Let's make sure nothing comes up. But of, of course, if it is something more serious, then we move them on to get them the right treatment in a timely fashion with our other providers. Um, and then get to watch them grow and develop after that. Here's our providers, myself, Dr. Kirkwood, uh, graciously fills in to see these children. Um, anytime I'm having my own children or um, I'm unavailable. Um, and then I work with a group of other pediatric providers in the dermatology and, um, and surgery fields that perform the surgeries on these patients. And with that, I will leave you with my thank yous. Thank, thank you. you. So we have one question already for Brittany, and this is, uh, does the pigmented lesion assay spoken about earlier by Andrew have any role in identifying the atypical melanocytic lesions of children? Um, I think that answer is easy because it's, as of now, I would say no, um, but as I hope I have um, convinced everyone that any new technology, any new test, anything new that can that can allow us to detect melanoma sooner in kids and then have prospective data so that we know how to treat them, we would wanna be included up front. So I think as of now, no, but um, I'm hopeful for the future that we would have more information. Yeah. Thank you, Brittany. And I should mention that all of our trials that we're doing with industry, our adjuvant trials, our advanced disease trials, we try desperately and we've had support from most of the pharmaceutical uh, sponsors that you see outside to include children 
in those trials. So this is really an ongoing work in progress. So with the morning done and a um, uh, series of wonderful talks, I want to thank uh, first my administrative assistant, Lisa, without whom this wouldn't happen. This has been a ton of work, but Lisa has done this with fervor and with vigor and with follow through for many, many years now and hopefully many years to come. Um, basically, Lisa, thank you, because this uh, really is uh, something I know I enjoy every year, but I think uh, we hope everybody else who's participated enjoys and does uh, uh, give us comments on. Second, the presenters, uh, it was a really wonderful set of talks and uh, both for the people who've talked at this session before, our new uh, faculty, Catherine, um, we really uh, tremendously appreciate the, uh, the involvement of our speakers, our uh, caretakers and our people who can discuss really in basic terms, all of these things that we've talked about this morning. And finally, the four major sponsors that we had, um, and I think uh, Novartis, uh, BMS, uh, Natera, Pfizer, uh, are pillars of this effort, and really we're very grateful for them. Finally, to aim at melanoma, who's done this both nationally, and I should also say globally for melanoma with a website and presentations that are in multiple languages available to patients all over the globe, uh, this is really a huge effort that we uh, look forward to continuing. And please. So thank you, Dr. Kirkwood and everyone from the Hillman Cancer Center. This has been wonderful. There are two things that I'm gonna take away with me today. Um, the first is hearing that the number of people dying from melanoma is diminishing, which I think deserves a round of applause. <laughs> it's wonderful. And then the second thing, which is not quite as important, um, and, and Dr. Navarre is not, he's not responsible, Navarre is not responsible for my interpretation, but um, I heard him say that college students' guts are the healthiest, which made me, which I interpreted as I should be eating more hoagies and drinking more beer. <laughs> Did I hear that right? <laughs> Very quickly and levity aside, I wanted to talk for just about two minutes about amet melanoma and um, the ways in which we intend to support people who are living with melanoma. So um, that starts with our website. Um, and we have a soup to nuts website that we have to offer everyone who is early in their journey. Uh, we have side effect uh, management guides. We have a um, we have clinical trial matching service, um, and um, we also have a new set of melanoma 101 videos that we are putting out. Um, I have forewarned Melissa Wilson that I'm going to say her name several times. Aim is very very lucky to have Melissa as a part of our team, and um, she is the host of these 101. Um, uh, webinars um, that she is putting out, and I encourage you to see them. The other thing that she does and does so very well is um, ask an expert. Um, she uh, will take questions from the community when they have been to see their practitioners, and they still have questions about um, their pathology report or um, decisions for next steps. Uh, you can, there's a form you can fill out, and Melissa will answer those questions for you. Um, so that um, you feel more comfortable with where, what, you know, your treatment process. Um, another thing that Melissa does for us <laughs> is a webinar series called From the Clinic to the Living Room. Um, these, this, these webinars um, are based uh, largely on the questions that she gets from our Ask a Medical Expert questions, and they are wonderful, and I encourage um, you to go and look at all of these um, uh, webinars and things that, that Melissa puts out for us. Uh, we also have a podcast called Beyond the Clinic, and that is hosted by Dr. Ray Liu, who was with Permanente, with Kaiser Permanente. And um, th that um, podcast is, we, we discuss it this in this podcast, the kinds of things that aren't typically talked about inside of, um, you know, a, a clinical setting, things like diet, or stress management, or um, talking to your family about cancer. 
just beautifully done. And um, again, I encourage you to go and view those. Um, then um, it, it's something else that we provide that we often will have people who contact us and they are interested in being connected to other people who are walking the journey of melanoma. And we have a one-on-one -on -one peer support program called Peer Connect. Individuals who have walked their journey um, and they are now in a position to offer an empathetic ear and wisdom to people who are newly diagnosed. If you are interested in having a mentor along your journey, please get in touch with me and I will happily connect you with a mentor. And then finally, um, people are interested in supporting AIM in general. And um, we uh, have people who are volunteering for us for a, a wide variety of reasons. And not the least of which is our Steps Against Melanoma Walks. And I know that um, Dr. Kirkwood would like to talk with you about the one that they are sponsoring here. So with that, I will say thank you to all and step aside and let him finish and close out our seminar. Thank you. So as Ann alluded to, uh, my, fast, my last comment really is on May 13th, Saturday uh, in only six weeks, North Park Boathouse, which is a wonderful venue. Um, and basically, um, apropos of what Brittany was just talking about in terms of pediatric melanoma, a young lady, she was 11 when we saw her, uh, had a melanoma, which we did a sentinel note on, was positive, got the uh, then only available adjuvant therapy, but is now the lead on a an sculling team from a local uh, high school who's actually just interviewed for colleges and uh, is coming back to do uh, the uh, opening talk at our uh, walk-ins against melanoma on the 13th. So I invite you all to that um, on the 13th and thank you for participating in today's uh, uh, symposium and look forward to seeing you a year from now uh, when we will be back again uh, doing different things with other unsung heroes in this uh, huge team that we have. And hopefully, and I think we can almost guarantee you, uh, we will have more new progress to report to you. Uh, but remember, the whole purpose of this morning was you all, because everyone thinks we're here to teach the fellows and the residents and the medical students, but we aren't. We're really here to teach our patients because you're the best exponents for all of this learning. And we look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you.